I think there's just one person, Ali Martinez, that also needs to uh, be let in. You might have her full first name, Alejandro. There I go. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Hi. Mr. Chair, we're ready when you are. Fabulous. Thank you, uh, Carrie. Just, just so you know, we're, we're having broadcast issues, but we are live on boston.gov and on YouTube. So if folks are interested in watching along, you'd have to do so at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, all right, folks, we are going to get started. I'm just going to briefly open it up and then turn it over to the two co-chairs and then, uh, or excuse me, uh, the, the chairs, uh, the, the uh, authors of this, and then we will get to um, testimony. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt O'Malley. I'm a Boston City Council representing District 6, as well as the chair of the Council's Committee on Environment, Resiliency, and Parks. Uh, this is a working session. It's being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv. Uh, it will be rebroadcast on Activity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, as well as Verizon Fios Channel 964. Um, we will take public testimony at the end of this working session. If you wish to testify via video conference, please email ron.cobb, that's R-O-N dot C-O-B-B, at boston.gov to sign up. Uh, when you are called, please state your name and affiliation, as well as uh, please limit your comments to no more than two minutes to ensure that all voices can be heard. Additionally, you may feel free to submit written testimony by emailing this committee. The address is CCC, City Council Committee, CCC.ESP uh, at boston.gov. Today we'll be discussing docket number 0297, order for a hearing regarding a city level conservation core for Boston. Uh, this was sponsored by city councilors Kenzie Bach and Michelle Wu. Uh, and this is a working session uh, following a tremendously successful hearing that we had uh, held last December, December 15th, in fact. Uh, it was really an exciting uh, event and I'm glad that the uh, sponsors are continuing this work and obviously you count my voice as the chorus that wholeheartedly support and endorse this, uh, the goals and the visions um, are so needed, particularly during this time as we rebuild not only our economy, but also a planet uh, with a real focus on environmental resiliency. <laughs> I look forward to continuing this conversation at this pro, uh, working session to discuss the feasibility of implementing a program. Um, and really, I'm looking forward to hearing from our colleagues from Philadelphia who are going to dis, uh, discuss their power core model, which is something that I think has already been proven to be enormously successful and hope we can replicate a similar type program here in the city. Um, so now I'd like to uh, hand it over to Councillor Bach for her introductions and then Councillor Wu, and then we'll do a, a quick round mm -hmm. robin of uh, city councillors before we get into the uh, um, panel. So Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you everyone for being here today. Um, as uh, Councillor O'Malley said, uh, we filed this last year. It really came um, actually in response to a bunch of conversations that we were having at budget season. Um, you know, I asked the environment department and. Um, the Office of Economic Development and Public Works, how we could be spending more of our capital money um, on the environmental projects we need to actually meet the cl city's climate goals and think about how to spend that money in ways that create a Boston-based local workforce with opportunities for our black and brown youth especially so that we can really both rebuild the economy um, and build towards a climate future in the city at the timeline, frankly, that we need to meet the urgency of both issues. Um, and so uh, we were excited to file this and then have, um, as was mentioned, a great hearing conversation uh, in the fall. Um, and I'm really grateful to Chief Cook, who's with us again today um, uh, for, for showing up and being such an active participant in that. And also to Trin Nguyen, who was with us from the Office of Workforce Development. Because um, one of the things that we've learned in this whole process is that to really get something big going here in the city, um, something that we could ramp up to really change the pace um, of this work, both on the workforce development front and the um, and in terms of the green infrastructure of our city, um, we're going to need a bunch of departments all working together. So, as I said, we've talked to YEE, our youth program, um, OWD, our workforce development core, and then uh, Chief Chief Cook um, from our whole kind of environmental and green space cabinet. Um, 
And uh, today we're really excited to be joined by Boston Water and Sewer um, because so much of the green infrastructure that we need to talk about in our city is stuff that's under their care. Uh, and the hearing back in the, um, in the fall, we focused in particular on urban forestry um, and a bunch of the, of the existing smaller programs that we've got in the city around that and the opportunities to really um, ramp that up under, uh, under Commissioner Woods' leadership. I think it's worth noting that um, we used to just have a lot more public jobs, even in the worlds of parks um, and public works, and that we really scaled back on that and that in many ways, um, our infrastructure, it, it needs us to scale up again if we're gonna meet our climate goals and it needs us to do it in a way that's equitable and offers um, a real job pipeline for our local talent in Boston. I would love it to be that we come out of uh, this process figuring out how to have a conservation core that not only lets us do a ton of this important work in Boston, but means that we're training the people um, that everyone else in the city and the country wants to hire. Um, but we do have some competition on that front from Philadelphia. In fact, they're uh, a bit ahead of us. Um, so uh, one of, you know, there's been a lot of real challenges about COVID and having to do our hearings and things online in COVID. But one advantage um, is the fact that we can invite uh, partners and colleagues from other cities and not ask them to all hop on the Amtrak um, to come up and join us. So uh, we're really excited today to have the Philadelphia Power Corps um, and um, Gerald Bright from the city side of their sort of stormwater management, who was, uh, I think, very instrumental in getting this going um, so that we really have an opportunity to, to learn from what a city to our south, um, also a historical city, um, uh, you know, with lots of similarities to Boston, um, what they're doing and how we can um, steal it uh, and uh, build upon it. So um, really excited for this working session today. Um, it is a working session. And so um, I, I'd encourage uh, both fellow counselors and also I know we've got a lot of our amazing advocates in Boston here today to sort of focus questions and comments on specifically like the Philadelphia model and how we can build on that because we do have our colleagues here today. And um, I anticipate that in partnership with Counselor Wu, this will be a continuing conversation um, as we work with the departments around what we could launch in the immediate term and how we could really um, build capacity around this going forward. So, so excited to be here today um, and uh, excited about all the work that is to come. So, uh, and, and also grateful for Wynn Constantini who's joined us from MIT who's been studying exactly what conservation core type programs are starting to look like in cities around the country and kind of what the opportunity there is. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Buck. Uh, Councillor Wu, the floor is yours for a brief opening statement, and then we'll hear from Councillors Braden and Baker. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm so grateful to Councillor Bach for her leadership <clears throat> and inviting me to partner on this. I'm very excited um, to make sure that Boston is is stepping out again. We're, we're, we're a little behind, but we're going to take the lead. <laughs> so very grateful to Philadelphia for helping us with with those insights. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic and in this moment has, has really showed what communities and particularly black and brown communities have known all along that the scale of our crises even before COVID um, is deep and that they are so interconnected and interlinked. And so right now, as we're thinking about a recovery grounded in public health recovery, of course, and the vaccinations in creating the healthiest, uh, most resilient communities so that we will not be in this position again relative to a, you know, knock on wood, potential um, future pandemics, um, the economic crisis and how we are needing to strengthen workers who have been essential and how, how fragile our economy has been for so many who uh, continue to struggle to put food on the table because of um, working conditions and an economy that has not been fair and inclusive of everyone. And of course our climate crisis and racial wealth gap, uh, Boston's I think, twin underlying um, challenges that are that are most urgent across every community. This program is really the embodiment of how we start to address, bring forward solutions that are just as interlinked and tackle all of these crises head on. Um, so I'm proud that this council had you know, now well over a year ago um, voted to endorse the federal Green New Deal to lend our support behind the, the, the national initiative, which includes a, a comparable piece of, of this. Um, as well as in our local and Boston Green New Deal to emphasize that this is a piece to tie together worker centers, communities, our climate goals, closing the racial wealth gap um, and doing so with put, by putting the city's money where our mouth is um, and really investing in our own communities. So 
I'm really grateful and eager to keep this conversation going. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Uh, Councilor Braden, do you have a brief opening statement? Yes, very brief. Um, I echo this, the sentiments of my two colleagues, uh, Councillor Wu and Councillor Bach. I think this is a tremendous initiative. I'm looking forward to learning about um, how Philadelphia has been doing this. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if there's a good model out there, we can see how we can adapt it to what we do in, all, in Boston. So uh, I look forward to the conversation and, and thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Braden. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and also to the, uh, to the sponsors. Very interesting concept. I'm, <clears throat> I'm in theory on board. I'd like to, you know, I, I think we, it would be nice if we could use this as a way to uh, build and train a city workforce that we could bring into, into mm -hmm. our, you know, the, the long-term goal. I'd be interested to see, you know, when we get deeper into this, how we as the city would pay for it, what, what we're thinking. Interested to see if the um, forthcoming federal dollars, if we could, if we could get, get something going with, with that money, that would be nice. Um, nice to see John Sullivan here so we could, we can really, no pun intended, dig into the water issues that we're having around, you know, come up with plans for infrastructure around, you know, between John and Chris Cook and, and Ryan at the parks department. There's a, there's a wealth of things that we could tackle and undertake if we had a, a workforce, a labor force. And, and uh, March is actually my 35th year in the, in the city of Boston as an employee. And I was uh, part of labor cuts. So uh, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about building a force that we, we, the city would be able to control and do our own, our own thought out infrastructure projects. So um, in theory, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in this and uh, thank you for the hearing today. Thank you and happy anniversary, Councilor Baker. That's great. Thank you for your, your long time service, great service. Um, all right, so I believe we're gonna begin with the administration's panel um, and that will be Chief Chris Cook from EEOS, Commissioner Ryan Woods of the Parks Department, John Sullivan, Chief Engineer of Boston Water and Sewer. And thank you for wearing a tie, uh, Mr. Sullivan. And I believe uh, Trin Nguyen will be joining us in a little bit, uh, Councilor Bach, is that correct? I'm not sure if Trin can make it today. Um, we did have her at the last one, um, but I know that o o OWD is paying attention and plugged in. So. All right, fair enough. Uh, we'll, we'll add Trin if uh, she arrives. So um, Chief Cook, uh, the floor is yours. If you wanna take it away for any brief opening remarks and then we'll get right into Councillor's questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, first off for holding the hearing, obviously, thank you to the sponsors, Councillor Bach, Councillor Wu. I also want to thank you, Councillor Malley, for my usable, uh, reusable straw that I'm using today. So thank you for that. You know, we're here to learn. Um, we're excited to learn from our colleagues in Philadelphia and really establish those connections between the Cradle of Liberty and, and the Liberty Bell um, and strengthen our climate resilience as we learn these best practices. But I, I especially want to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank the leadership of folks like Commissioner Woods at Boston Parks, who has put to work hundreds of people in the city of Boston um, with the budget uh, that was given to us by the mayor and by the city council. I also wanna thank Trin Nguyen of the workforce development and all the, the hard work she does, especially focusing on opportunities for socially vulnerable populations. And you know, we're joined again today by John Sullivan, the chief engineer of Boston Water and Sewer Commission who has really been looking at the opportunities of expanding uh, workforce while also providing resiliency and you know something that we really take for granted here in the city of Boston, clean, reliable water. You know, and a lot of cities across the country are really at a crisis point with their water supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, Boston Water and Sewer Commission is best in class. And by the way, is often voted the best tasting water in, in the country. So that's no small feat in itself. You know, racism is a public health crisis and the climate crisis puts our socially vulnerable populations and our populations of color even more at risk on top of that. But through crisis, there is always opportunity. So today, uh, the administration is here to learn again from our colleagues. Um, with that, uh, I will just give uh, the floor over to Ryan Woods for a bit of context. We discussed this at length at the last um, at the last hearing, so uh, we will be brief, but I wanna give them a, a little bit of context of what we did last summer in response to pandemic and trying to create uh, workforce opportunities for city kids. Commissioner. 
Thank you, Chief. Um, this past summer, obviously being a unique summer for us, we were met with a challenge of we couldn't have a lot of our normal jobs with youth working indoors. So how do we put youth to work outdoors? And we went back to an old concept that as I was growing up, it's called the red shirts. And this year we called it blue shirts as they wore blue shirts um, that were out in the community. And they did park projects. Um, some of them were um, more engaged than others. Some days were more based on trash pickup and making sure that parks remain safe, welcoming, clean, just like the mission of the parks department. But throughout this whole summer program, we saw the excitement that kids like to work outdoors. They enjoyed being involved in the community. Um, so I think it's a great idea to hear what our folks from Philadelphia have to say and how we could build this conservation core. The one missing link that we noticed we had this summer was that we did not have as many experts. Our supervisors were college age kids that you know supervised the, the youth, had <clears throat> timesheets, made sure everyone was reporting each day, but they weren't really um, skilled enough to teach the lessons to the kids. You have great opportunities with, that we've seen through the Emerald Necklace Conservancy with Pat Alvarez, who I know uh, is watching along today in Southwest Boston CDC, where groups do these projects, especially in our urban wild areas where they learn skills such as rise over run. They put stuff that they're learning in school with outdoor um, in nature. And there's, um, for example, looking at what is a bioswale, learning about bioswales. How big does this bioswale have to be to retain the amount of water that's coming down? So the life skills and lessons, and that's something that we'd hope to grow. And in order to have that, we need more leaders, uh, more supervisors that have those skills um, to teach these youth, get them excited and give them that job readiness training so they want to continue in these type of fields. So I think we started off as a successful place this past summer, but there's definitely a lot of room to grow and a lot of potential. To so, uh, thanks for involving the Parks Department in this uh, working session. And we look forward to uh, learn from our colleagues in Philadelphia. Thank you. So, so Councillor, um, you know, Trin will be joining us a little bit later, but uh, John Sullivan, the Chief Engineer of Water and Sewer, I didn't know if you wanted to say any few words, John. Yeah, I want to first say I appreciate being invited. We need to be part of this. Uh, as, as you all recall, we have an obligation to do green infrastructure with a consent decree with the EPA and the federal court. Over the next 30 years, we have already completed uh, Central Square, Audubon Circle, and we're going to have a fantastic green infrastructure on City Hall Plaza, which is under construction right now. We already have built five demonstration green infrastructures at the Boston Public Schools, and we uh, developed a curriculum approved by the state to be taught in all public schools in Massachusetts so we can teach our youth the value of all of this, and then that's going along fine. Um, we, we're putting together a manual on GI, you'll be seeing that. We have over 2,000 green infrastructure structures built on private property throughout the city. Um, everyone that wants to build in the city gets to join in and work with us on green infrastructure. Um, therein lies the problem. We have built them. Uh, we need to find a way to maintain them. We've been working with uh, Dave Quigley out of uh, Cardinal Square C C to train additional people and get them certified so they understand what's going on and, and perhaps have them work with these privates. Now, how will we get them to do that? We are evaluating a stormwater fee because we need to justifiably uh, charge properly. The people with the big parking lot should be paying more than the person with the little house uh, to upgrade this. And remember, this is our city. And what's important to that is Boston Water Sewer owns no land. We can only do green infrastructure on other people's lands, on public roadways, parks, or any other public property that we have. So we need to work with the city. And don't think we haven't been watching Philadelphia, New York, and DC. Um, they were addressing the problem for CSO control. Uh, we've been working years. Uh, the thing we've learned is that the early bird gets the worm, but it's the second rat that gets the cheese. So we, we learn from their mistakes. And that's what's so important is to evaluate what everyone's doing, take the best of the best and apply it here. And I, and I have all the faith in the world that we're going to come out as number one on running the green infrastructure. Back over to you. Yeah. So, Councillor, we, you know, there's nothing more to elaborate after that uh, statement by John Sullivan. So we will uh, turn it back to you. Thank you, sir.
And, and please, to our friends in Philadelphia, rat is absolutely a term of endearment in the, the hub of the universe. So well said all. Um, so given the fact that this is a working session and, and had the pandemic not been happening, we would be sitting around a table in the curly room right now. Um, I'm going to try to do foster as much of sort of that uh, easy back and mm -hmm. forth. So rather than doing a round robin set of questions from counselors after every panel, I'd now like to ask our colleagues from Philadelphia, uh, Julia Hellengas and, and Gerald Bright, um, if they would give our presentation and then maybe we can facilitate, you know, more of a sort of a question and answer and, and, and less formalized conversation about this with folks from the administration, provided that's that's good with everybody. Um, also wanted to acknowledge Councillor Flynn has joined us as well from District 2. Welcome, Councillor Flynn. Um, so, uh, Ms. Helen Gass, Mr. Bright, would you like to, I believe you have a little bit of a, do you have a PowerPoint presentation or just? Um... I, have a, I have a short presentation. I can share my screen. Okay, great. Um, yep, there you go. And while I'm doing that, just want to introduce the other folks from Philly, so folks who know knows who's in the room. So I'm the co-founder and executive director of PowerCore PHL. I actually started as a as a city employee when we were founding it as a, the deputy service officer under our civic engagement office. Um, Gerald Bright is, is was one of the founding staff people from <coughs> Philadelphia Water um, at the time and continues to be involved. Uh, Mark Camarada, also from Philadelphia Water, is on today, um, but also for my team, Jasmine, Oglesby is our director of trauma-informed practice and oversees supportive services, all the wraparound services that you would think of on top of the technical skills, um, as well as Ali Martinez and, and Zamir Williams are both alumni of the program and currently in leadership roles with us. So if you're looking to hear directly about folks' experiences in the program, ask them to be here today and they're, they're happy to talk about their experience as well. So to start, um, you know, this is our mission. We advance the community while connecting people to careers. Um, to give you a sense of what we do at this point in time. So we started in 2013 in the recession. So one, I just wanna thank uh, counselors for having the vision to talk about this now, to have the urgency to talk about this now and to remind and to sort of encourage you that, yes, we're going through a lot. Yes, we're going through multiple pandemics and we were born out of a recession as well. And it's definitely the right time to do it. Um, since then we've expanded quite a bit. So you'll see, you know, bottom, Bottom left of the screen, that's our green infrastructure crew, maintaining um, surface surface tree trenches. Uh, top left is our now our solar and electrical uh, academy that we've built out over the past year or two. We also have an urban forestry crew that are climbing in trees, using wood chippers, heavy equipment, things like that, that also was built out in the past two years. And then our sort of standard parks work on the bottom right. Just to give you a little bit of visual, because again, COVID notwithstanding, we would be inviting you down to site visit. I'd take you around all the sites and you guys could see it in action for yourselves. So I just want to share a little bit of that. This is the, you know, the basic blueprint. We recruit obviously very targeted to a certain demographic of young people who we know are out of school, out of work or un underemployed, right? So we know that sometimes folks can get sort of retail jobs. They're not getting a lot of um, hours. There's not a lot of mobility. And so we're really targeting those young people. We have a specific focus in Philadelphia also on returning citizens or folks who are under supervision, permission, and parole. Uh, we recruit them in to something called the foundations phase. That's what we originally started with was just that. So that's, you know, crew-based conservation core, what you think of when you think of um, youth conservation cores. We have our staff people who have experience in both trauma-informed care, but also in environmental stewardship, running those crews. And they're getting work orders and we complete a scope of work um, for our parks and water department. That's how we started. And we did that for about four or five years, just running about six of those crews all throughout the city. Um, as we really collaborated deeply with the water department and other city departments, what we found is that the needs of the city were more sophisticated and more technical than that. And so we really worked to build out a second phase to the program. So after you complete your four months and foundations, you as a young person has, have learned to cuff some skills, you explored what you think you like or don't like, what you think is a good fit, and then you apply into the much more technical and career specific tracks in your second phase of which there are many, many options. And that's when it starts to get very customized. Uh, the whole uh, inspiration from that, and I'm happy to have Gerald talk about this more, was our partnership with Water that forced us to make our very first industry academy in green stormwater infrastructure to really go deeper in the technical skills, teach folks how to work at pace so that when they're transitioning into either city employment or private sector employment, um, they can make that transition from a trainee to an apprentice or to an employee much quicker, um, pushing the pace. 
we now have Green Infrastructure Academy, Solar Academy, Urban Forestry Academy. Um, this is our youth work track. We often get young people who come to us and realize that they really want to do what our staff do, which is working with young people, coaching them, mentoring them. And, and they are now either 23% of our staff are alumni, but they also work in culture and climate positions in schools and other nonprofits, other um, violence prevention outreach positions, things like that. And then we have something called, we call fellowships, which is essentially paid internships that are hosted by other community-based organizations. Um, and those are very individualized. So if a young person really wants to do something around food justice, we find an organization, they host them, we still subsidize their pay, and they get this very robust uh, career experience. For folks who are unfamiliar, uh, almost, uh, so first of all, all of this experience when a young person with it is paid in one of two ways. They're either paid through an AmeriCorps stipend that we supplement the rate to get a higher tilting wage, or we're just paying them straight out if it's, if it's not appropriate to be using AmeriCorps dollars, which at this point in time, only our solar track um, which is, was not a good fit with AmeriCorps. Um, AmeriCorps offers a couple of great benefits. So you, as a young person, every time you complete a term, you unlock an education award that can be used within seven years to any accredited post-secondary institution. So community colleges, four-year institutions, trade schools, all that. So that's just money in the bank that folks are earning um, through their service. But also um, a couple of years ago, I worked with our civil service in Philadelphia to provide preference points for any AmeriCorps alum in recognition of their service to the city. So when they sit for those uh, civil service tests, uh, they can earn up to five additional preference points depending on how long they've served in AmeriCorps. It doesn't just have to be Power Corps, any AmeriCorps, so City Year is included in that, any AmeriCorps program, but it's in recognition of their domestic and civil service, the same way that we recognize veterans a little bit less in terms of preference point and scale. But um, that's something that, you know, I can I can talk at another time about how we really had that conversation with civil service and talk that through. Um, and then just stats on, on us. So, you know, this is not, these are not quotas, but this is what our, you know, the average of our demographics are when I said we're doing targeted recruitment. Um, so that again, like 40% are parents, young parents, both men and women. And so really when you're, you're paying people for their time, you're impacting not the individual, but that whole family unit as well. Um, and these are our tenants. So we specifically recruit untapped talent. We work directly with employers. In many cases, those employers are the city themselves, city departments themselves. Sometimes they're not. We do quite a bit of work with private contractors as well. Uh, we pay people for their time while they're in training and work experiences. And our goal is to get people into high quality jobs so that they can um, continue to move um, forward with their careers. And that we strongly believe that if you help, that you can help young people and individuals through helping the community at large. Um, finally, this is a little bit more about those, those, those industry academies that I spoke about. And I can send these slides um, afterwards as well. Like I said, very directly co-developed with Philadelphia Water Department. Um, I'll, I'll move it to Gerald in a second, um, and then refined through industry groups and private sector contractors and feedback as that as that um, landscape has evolved. We've also evolved with that. Same with urban forestry, co-developed with our parks department as well as Bartlett the Trees, um, and really addressing some job quality issues and landscaping that tends to be seasonal. And then same with solar and electrical. Um, some stats of ours, like I said, you know we're very we very strongly believe that we are addressing racial equity, wealth gap, unemployment, uh, you know, gun violence and climate issues at the same time. We braid everything that we do together with those goals in mind um, to maximize the co-benefits. So we get quite a bit of, of city funding, of state funding, of federal funding. And our, our model is to amplify as much impact as possible with each dollar. Um, and so these are some of our stats. Um, and I'd say that, for recidivism, just to put that in context for folks, uh, in Philadelphia, the average recidivism rate is 45%. Our in-program recidivism rate is 3%, and one year post is still only eight. Obviously, you want that lower, but when you compare that to what we're seeing for someone not involved in power core at all, that's about 45%. Uh, again, COVID, um, it was hard when it first hit, and then we really were able to pivot and figure it out. A big part of that, I think you guys acknowledge, is because most of our work is outdoor and hands-on, we're able to socially distance and be safe um, in ways that are, are, are easier for us to sort of operationalize. We moved all classroom-based uh, training to, you know, virtual to Zoom, um, but we're able to continue our hands-on training um, 
almost without a hitch, you know, after figuring out you know, really what was going on with the country after a couple months. Um, and we continue to do that now. And we're very proud that we've had zero community spread within the program based on our, our safety protocols, based on, you know, how we're monitoring the situation and taking, taking care of that. Um, so I'll end the presentation now and really would like Gerald to add more color, especially to our work with you guys. And then we can sort of open it up a little bit more. All right, thanks, Julia. That was great. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll jump in with some specifics to uh, Water's involvement, but I'll, I'll introduce myself briefly. So I'm Gerald Bright. I'm an administrative scientist and with the Water Department, and I serve as the Assistant Operations Director of our Green Stormwater Operations Unit. So we again were an early adopter power core, uh, as Julia mentioned in 2013. We were very much so a, a small program. Uh, at that time, there may have been five administrative professionals, scientists, engineers, such as myself, um, with a handful of contractors. And at that time, we had about 400 uh, stormwater manager practices in the right of way or in off right of way settings, parks, uh, so on and so forth. So, again, being uh, to some extent understaffed and uh, in many regards under resourced, we thought Power Corps would be a great way to supplement our workforce uh, for maintenance. So where we started, uh, you know, we knew that the this, this skill level would be a challenge, training would be a challenge. So uh, we made full commitment to training. And as we train Power Core fellows, uh, how we wanted them to maintain our green storm infrastructure practices, uh, we really coined, we think coined a term, which we, we refer to as aesthetic maintenance, right? So uh, being an urban city, uh, trash, litter, debris, it, it is an eyesore, but if you put it in the context of uh, green infrastructure, you're talking about clogging inlets, clogging overflow structures. So, you know, what we really train them to do is, or, or we train them um, as if they were aesthetic maintenance technicians. So some could call it picking up trash or just removing debris. Um, but again, I think that gave them that hands-on experience of working although at a lower skill level, working directly in the GSI systems uh, along the way, they were uh, taught, trained, how the systems were actually working. So after a while, they became fully immersed. Uh, they really bought into uh, the fact that they were uh, helping to maintain GSI systems, keeping them in operation. And uh, many of them, you know, being from Philadelphia, um, they were working in their neighborhoods. Um, at, at GI that was in their neighborhood. So they really bought into it. And that was that was huge for us, I, again, because we were supplementing our uh, small workforce at the time. So uh, as years went on, Julia mentioned how Power Core did make, they worked with us and they really uh, did a great job, I think, in developing the um, industrial academies. But, you know, at the same time they were doing that, we were working, again, to, to continue supplementing our workforce. Uh, Power Core was an impetus for us to revamp, reinvigorate our apprenticeship program. Um, at the time, our apprenticeship program, uh, most of them worked as, as technicians uh, in plants, uh, instrumentation technicians, but uh, we had some uh, key staff here at Water um, and, and Power Core as well that you know, really pushed us to take a second look at workforce development, our apprenticeship program. And from there, we began taking those very talented uh, uh, candidates from Power Core and bringing them in as apprentices. Um, and that allowed us to, you know, supplement again our in-house uh, maintenance staff. Um, within a year or so, uh, we actually started to work on our job specifications. So we made some modifications to our grounds and facility workers uh, specification, um, which essentially is, is it's landscaping, uh, but more so at water was used for facilities and maintenance. So as Julie mentioned, you know, her work with civil service to get AmeriCorps uh, members uh, some additional credits, additional points on the exams, we worked in a similar fashion to make sure that we could get Power Corps apprentices, uh, you know, uh, from Power Corps, you know, allow that experience to make them eligible for the grounds and facility maintenance worker series. So uh, within a short time, uh, again, of, of starting with Power Corps in 2013, by 2016, uh, we were able to bring them into full-time civil service positions. And it actually allowed us to start our in-house uh, grounds maintenance team, um, which as we understand, it's, it's the first or one of the first uh, in-house or let's say civil service uh, grounds crews that's devoted purely to green stormwater infrastructure. 
So um, from our perspective, you know, we had the contracts, but as we uh, begin to grow, you know, we are accepting 200, 300, 400 new systems a year with most of our labor force being contracts. We knew that was not sustainable. So we were um, assured that, you know, developing this internal civil service workforce uh, to, to supplement the work being done with by contractors was essential. Um, and Power Corps became the pipeline to get us there. Um, so uh, moving forward uh, to 2020, we're at a point where, you know, our ground, we have, at, right now we have four crews, four grounds crews, four person crews. Um, 70, almost 70% 70 of those are Power Corps alumni. Um, our first grounds maintenance supervisor, um, is a Power Corps alum, Aaron Kirkland. Uh, he, Julia showed his photo a little earlier. Um, we're very proud of, proud of him. Uh, he's uh, for the country, you know, speaking um, very eloquently uh, about his experience with Power Corps, what it's done for him, how it's changed his life. Um, so, so we, you know, we appreciate that. But you know, the fact that you know he started as a Power Corps crew member, as a fellow, uh, as an apprentice uh, came in as a full-time civil servant in the grounds maintenance series and he is now our supervisor is it, huge um, and it speaks directly to the benefits of power Corps for the city um, a, a few other highlights um, if you think about Aaron as our first supervisor a uh, hundred percent of our crew chiefs so those four crews are all staffed by uh, crew chiefs all of them are power Corps. Um, so another some of the more of the highlights that I could speak to um, in the beginning, we started with what we called aesthetic maintenance, which essentially did boil down to, uh, you know, uh, trash debris removal. Um, there were some aspects of maybe light pruning that we started to introduce. Um, but, you know, we, we, over time, were able to uh, teach additional skills. Again, as Julie spoke to the uh, Industrial Academy, you know, once we were able to work with those folks and they had that sense of per permanence, and they got additional training, we were able to kind of ramp up the work that we were able to give to them. Uh, so one of the big things that we talk with the Power Corps about is we want to be able to treat them as contract. Um, you know, that includes, uh, you know, data uh, record keeping, uh, being able to work within our work order management system, right? Um, so we gave them the responsibility um, they met the challenge and with that industrial academy, you know, they began to move from aesthetic maintenance to actually full responsibility for surface maintenance, as we call it, at our vegetated systems. And right now about 80% of our tree trenches citywide, which, you know, we have about four to 500 tree trenches citywide. Um, so they are totally the responsibility of power pool. So if you can imagine within, uh, seven short years going from aesthetic maintenance and essentially you know, removing trash, litter, debris, short dumping to taking full scale responsibility for surface maintenance. Um, so, you know, they've got their trucks, they've got trailers, they're grabbing their own mulch, um, you know, they're, they're taking the debris and disposing off site. I mean, they are essentially uh, working as contractors for the, the water department, um, which another benefit, again, as I spoke to, pipeline for our workforce development uh, initiatives. Um, you know, we are able to grab some apprentices uh, and candidates from some of our industrial uh, uh, trade academies here in the city. Uh, we have an agriculture school here in the city, but as uh, I spoke to you earlier, uh, right now, 60, 70% of our staff are coming from Power Corps. So they are the main uh, kind of asset in that, in that workforce development pipeline. So um, I would say it's been nothing but a successful success story for the water department. Um, you know, again, uh, I think as an earlier adopt, adopter, we learned a lot, but it was a, it came at a critical time for us. Again, as we were uh, increasing the number of our green infrastructure assets and did not have a lot of resources, uh, it was the perfect timing to bring in Power Corps. Um, but now we've, since we've transitioned to, you know, developing more resources, um, Power Corps, I think is, is once we really got into the industrial academy, it was that thing that allowed us to uh, begin to do things like match skill level uh, to task, right? So if you can imagine before Power Corps, you may have been paying these contractors at 30, 40, 50 an hour to go and pick up that trash and remove that debris. 
Um, but again, having power core, uh, we had the fellows crews, we had the industrial academy, we had the high end contractors. So, you know, it really gave us a lot more flexibility, um, many more options in regards to, you know, who we send, what jobs to. Um, and, you know, again, the ability, ability I'm sorry, to leverage, uh, you know, these, this different capacity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bright. That was a, a great overview. Um, I want to acknowledge you've been joined by uh, uh, Trin Wen as well uh, from the administration. Welcome, Trin. Um, so I think, again, before we get into more of a discussion, since there's only one more uh, presentation, and it's a little, uh, should, should be a little bit uh, brief, is uh, Wynn Constantini, uh, a graduate student from MIT. Um, Wynn, would you um, uh, like to sort of uh, uh, remark on some of your, or give your remarks, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Yeah, great. Um, I also have some slides. Great. Are you, uh, Carrie, could you make sure that Wynn can uh, share their screen? Yeah, I think. Thanks. Great. Um, cool. Okay, so I'm Wynn Costantini. I'm a graduate student at the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, and the research I'm working on um, is really aiming to contribute to the program design and program design process um, for this future core in a way that aligns Boston's climate, economic, and racial justice goals within the larger uh, context of a Boston Green New Deal. Um, so I did have done 46 interviews um, with local, state, and national stakeholders. Um, and I so far have basically turned this into um, a visualization of the existing green workforce development ecosystem in Boston. Um, and throughout these interviews, I was thinking about um, how different stakeholders see their work fitting in with this future core um, and how they think it should be designed and implemented. Um, and again, uh, implemented in a way that is integrating these various goals. Um, so this is the ecosystem I put together. Um, this slide is really just to show you that it is complicated. Um, and so, uh, it made sense to me to split up the sectors into natural environment, which is green infrastructure, urban forestry, and wastewater, um, and the built environment, um, where the sectors were a little harder to pull apart, um, but have to do with new construction and retrofitting, as well as building operation um, and maintenance. Um, and then I've also broken these ecosystems up into like smaller embedded ecosystems, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of those. Um, so those are like career, potential career paths, um, like policy ecosystems, advocates. Um, and uh, I think, so I'm gonna show you, um, sorry, one more thing. Basically there's color coding in the ecosystem, especially because items within the ecosystem often are relevant to multiple sectors. Um, and so that was how I showed that. There's different shapes for different types of items and different arrows to show existing versus potential relationships um, and potential career paths. Um, so this is uh, an example career path, just urban forestry. I have ones for every sector. Um, and I think that this is a good place to start in terms of building out something like an industry academy that PowerCore has. Um, so in this example, um, we have it starting just as an example from the Teen Urban Tree Corps, uh, with this currently which speak for the trees and they're working on building out more of a workforce development focus. And so from this core, someone could theoretically go to UMass Amherst for post-secondary education or straight to an apprenticeship um, or ground crew with a landscaping or tree care company. And then from that could either be hired by that or another company, work for a utility or potentially uh, start their own company. Um, and then this is the more built environment potential career paths. As you can see, it, it is harder to pull apart a little more complex, um, but we have some secondary education institutions like Youth Build and Madison Park, um, post-secondary uh, like the Rox uh, Roxbury Community College Smart Building Technology um, Program, um, which is just getting started. And so there's a lot of entry and exit points. Like people don't have to have be starting in the secondary education area. Um, they could go directly into something like Building Pathways, a pre-apprenticeship program or directly uh, into Roxbury Community College programs. Um, but then that is eventually leading into um, the Boston Building Trades Union ecosystem, eventually leading to either commercial um, or residential employment. Um, 
And so then I have some more maps. Uh, and these are what I'm calling shared inputs. So these are organizations in Boston that are already doing all of the work that is important to a core, but not sector specific. Um, and so there are educational partners, uh, funding sources, outreach and engagement, which is relevant to like the a particip participatory program design process, um, addressing barriers to employment, so like wraparound services, and then also um, important advocacy partners to include. Um, and so the next steps are really like, now that I have this map, where, where does a core fit in? Um, and how does a core either like embed itself in this ecosystem or prepare someone to join one of these already existing career paths in Boston? And also like serve as a way to further like strengthen and connect and support all of the people already doing this work in the city. Um, and for my future research, um, I'm going to think through um, some indicators that the city can use when evaluating different models, some grounding principles and values that I think are important to this core, um, and then also recommendations about um, how to make this process uh, participatory. Um, and so I know uh, you couldn't really read the diagrams. So if anyone is interested in seeing them in more detail, um, I'm happy to share them and talk about them. Um, that's my email and yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Wynn. That was uh, that was uh, very illuminating. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So again, this is going to be less of a formalized hearing where we sort of go back and forth. I really want us to foster a great conversation. It's a complicated issue, but an incredibly worthwhile issue. And the mere fact that uh, 76ers and Celtics fans are coming together on this, I think, shows uh, shows how important and momentous this day is. So, uh, Kenzie, I'm going to turn it over to you and then Michelle just to sort of, you know, begin the conversation. Again, you can ask anyone and, and feel free, the panelists as well, and the, the folks participating who aren't counselors, if you have further questions or need some, uh, you know, ideas, please feel free. This is an open conversation and it's my job just to uh, hopefully help facilitate it as best as we can. So, uh, Kenzie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, yeah, and thank you so much again to our, to our Philly colleagues for coming. I mean, honestly, there's just so much of your program that I just want us to steal. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and especially um, because of how it's dealing with, uh, you know, one of the problems that me and my staff have encountered as we've thought through this, it's somewhat reflected in Wynn's diagrams of just the complexity of the landscape. And also the fact that we want to create, like, you, you, we want to create a program that is creating multiple avenues for young people based on kind of their interests and aptitudes, right? So I think like realizing, like to Councillor Baker's point, you know, I'm very interested in how we can have this lead to city employment and building up a city workforce, but that can't be the only thing because we won't be able to employ as many people on the city budget side as I think we need to be doing this work, right? And then, and and also, frankly, you know, especially when it comes to building retrofits, but other things as well, you know, we as a city are are aiming to create a private market for this work as well by through, through our sort of regulatory actions, and I think. Part of the goal is if we're going to require people to do a lot of retrofitting work, let's also at the same time support a economic ecosystem of our local Boston folks who can be hired to do that work. And that's something Dave Queeley, who's here with us from Codman, um, the Common Square NEC has been thinking a lot about like how to give our, our young people the, the training and resources. But I think as you saw in Wins Diagrams, we're sort of in all these pocketed places right now. And so the question is like, how do you centralize that from the position perspective of a young person so that they kind of know the way in, but not centralize in the sense of like one size fits all. So I, I really appreciated your, um, your kind of that explanation, uh, Julia, about how you've kind of created that initial foundations moment. And then you've created these different pathways depending on um, where people are at. Um, I wondered um, if you or and or Gerald could talk a little bit about um, in terms of those next steps, it, like that folks take, like for instance, on the apprenticeship side, I mean, have you partnered with the unions or that, is that what we're talking about when we're talking about apprenticeships um, on the, um, on the uh, internal side, Gerald? Um, so you've ramped up, you know, are those, those uh, sit, those are the folks on your four ground crews, what I understood are they're all city employees, right? And you're sort of, um, uh, and 
And, and I think that's, I want to highlight for people, I think John Sullivan mentioned this, but you know, one of the big things with green infrastructure is that with gray infrastructure, we used to have a lot of stuff that we set and forget for 40 years, right? And with green infrastructure, we need people to actually maintain it. Um, and instead of asking his and, uh, and uh, Commissioner Woods folks to do more and more with less, like we need to give them more in terms of staff. So I think that kind of a path appealing to me. I wonder if you could speak a bit about how that transition kind of went. Um, and, and also it sounded to me like maybe Power Core started actually as a city, like internal to the city. And so if you could talk about why sort of you pulled the initial training out of the city ultimately, and it sounds like it's operating on an MOU, just a little bit of more of like that, those structural points and then um, details about, about your partnership with unions and others in the apprenticeship program would be great. So Julia, I guess I could take the first piece if you, you wanted yeah. to, uh, okay, so, um, and Kenzie, thank you. You know, I, I, one of the things I loved hearing was that you acknowledged the, that kind of nuance with green and gray. Uh, you, gray, you can set it and forget it. With green, you can't. And um, that was something that struck us immediately. Uh, and it was something that we really had to work uh, with the department internally to develop these additional resources for green. Um, because this was the, you know, I used to say, uh, this was the one thing we built that has to be pretty. You know, um, it's in the public right of way. Um, and, you know, it, on a more serious note, it's something that has to be maintained right of way, uh, I mean, immediately as soon as it's constructed. So, um, you know, that that need to develop resources, develop resources quickly um, was, was very important to us because we, we recognize that. Um, so uh, I think in the beginning, uh, we, again, I spoke to our apprenticeship program. Um, I think at the time it was fledgling and it was used mostly to support instrumentation techs in, in our plants. Um, it, it took some convincing and we had a lot of passionate people here at Water, um, you know, to actually, to make sure we were retaining power cords. So in the beginning, we used them to supplement the work that was being done by contractors. Um, but, you know, one of the issues that we ran into is that, you know, we were working with cohorts. So I, I forget, Julia, forgive me. I think they were six month cohorts, if, if not eight. But you know, one of the issues with the cohorts was that you you have to retrain and retool as those cohorts uh, move on. They may move on to employment. Some may stay. So they may be placed in employment. Some may stay. Some may be promoted to crew leaders. But um, you know that that need to continue retraining and know, uh, each cohort as they came through. Um, you know, it, 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 it did kind of weigh on us from, uh, to some regard because, mm -hmm. again, the consistency um, that you want if you're going to have a crew that goes to the same place every time um, that does it the same way, you're, you're going to keep starting from scratch. So um, that was, I think, some of the driver uh, partially from our end behind the, uh, you know, that that want for, for you know, something greater from Power Core, which became the uh, Industrial Academy. Um, but on our end, we realized that we had to be able to retain uh, the power core talent in, in whatever way possible, which became the apprenticeship program. Um, I, I, from you know the, their uh, work they were doing with power core for us, um, they wouldn't have met eligibility standards for any of the civil service titles that we had at the time, which is why on the back end, we started uh, working to make sure um, that if we were able to get uh, a, a power core apprentice that apprenticeship will qualify as the necessary or prerequisite training for the grounds and facilities uh, maintenance uh, series. So a lot of this, we, we kind of, you know, we were, you know, we jumped over one hurdle um, and looked to uh, prepare to jump over the next um, until we were able to get it all uh, working. But, um, you know, you asked a few questions here, so you could stop me and ask again if, if, if I didn't address anything, but, um, I guess the last thing I'll speak to is, is our in-house uh, grounds uh, maintenance crew. Um, I think that green infrastructure is so specialized at this point. Um, you know, we, we recognize the need to uh, have someone who's coming in with experience. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of experience to be had outside of perhaps working with uh, landscaping crews in a private sector who, who also specialize in green infrastructure, but it's very much so a niche market. Um, we have tried to pull people off the street, so to say, with general experience, landscaping experience, and it, it does take a while um, to kind of introduce them to the nuances of, of, of maintaining green infrastructure. 
Um, and that's where we've seen PowerCore being such a successful model because by the time they've come to us, um, you know, with hopes of a permanent civil ser service title, they've been working at least uh, maybe a year with PowerCore, another uh, almost a year in apprenticeship. So you're talking at least a year and a half of experience with green infrastructure. Um, I can speak too to uh, our contractors. So we have a core group of contractors. We've been working some as long as 10 years, um, same contractors. Um, they love power core, you know, because again, it's the same for them. They don't have to pull someone off the street and, and retool and retrain them to the nuances of GI, green infrastructure. Um, they have someone with that experience. So, you know, we're finding that in the beginning, we thought that a lot of our contractors were pulling power core alums because they, they thought that's what we wanted them to do. Um, they said, oh, this is going to look good for when I go to renew that contract. And, you know, over time, they, you know, and I think there may have been some of that in the beginning. Um, they thought it was giving them an edge over another contractor, um, something that we would like to see. But over time, you know, as they begin to pour, pull more, more and more uh, power core alums, they, they realize it too. Like there's built in experience here. I don't have to retool and retrain for nuances of GI. And they have several foremen, um, our contractor, uh, AKRF, Green up in particular that are uh, power core alums. So, um, hope I answered your question. Um, but if there's anything else, feel free. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add a little color to that. So, obviously, all of our civil servants are DC 33, so they're unionized as well. Um, and I think that the conversation with them is really like, you know, there's vacancies that have been sitting at water in DC 33 positions. We want to strengthen that union. When you think of sort of outside of DC 33, we've been working more recently directly with uh, the mason, uh, bricklayers and allied craft workers to create with them to create a masonry academy. So it's really helping to pull them in and design from the beginning. Um, you know, again, what those union, unions see as their need and their talent needs and where their gaps are. Um, we also have folks who have, you know, going to the fishing trades, things like that. But those are really like, okay, I, I as an individual, like know that this is the path that I want to take, that I want to go into, you know, traditional union work. Um, to the to what Water did, which I think is actually very doable in other cities, and and they've been highlighted across the nation. Gerald's being very humble, is that they essentially created in house. It's not a registered apprenticeship, but it's a fully civil servant five phase apprenticeship. Uh, within the civil service within water and they worked their HR team in, in water as well as central HR really worked to structure those specs and the structure of that pathway for folks. Um, and it's through that sort of back end work that really makes those career pathways smooth that really helped to fill talent needs there. I mean, we're meeting with the water HR team monthly to quarterly for them to give us a projection of when they think they're bringing on apprentices and what Outside of green infrastructure, we have apprentices now that are filling their surveying unit, that's filling electrional units, other skilled trades that we're working directly with HR to know what those are and then to build out the training pathways for them. So they're really, uh, you know, I think their HR department told me 60% of their apprentices that they then hire full time are coming from power force. So that's beyond just the green, that's including the skilled trades vacancies that they're seeing. Um, but more specifically, because yeah, so it started, so I actually wish I had when one of your maps when we started, that was like, you know, Philly's much like Boston, everybody knows each other, everyone's worked with each other a previous job. But so we basically created those maps, and then created um, advisory committees based on different things. So we when we were getting off the ground, my entire job was to corral our version of that map to get everyone to work together and figure out where we fit. And the point of power at the time was there's clearly a gap within that map and for us to fit in where we are. We have a very strong youth build program. We know that our conversation with youth build was you guys have graduates who aren't yet ready just go into straight employment. So that second tier of their graduates, send them to us, they'll get more time to mature, they'll get more time on the job, they'll get more work experience um, and then they'll be ready, right? Similarly, we have, um, you know, so we pulled together, we call recruitment partners. And for a while, we didn't even do open applications. We only took clients from those existing community-based organizations, supported social services agencies who had clients who are ready for job training. So maybe they just got their GED or they just finished an alternative high school or they just came home from prison and they are ready for the next thing. So we were really activating. We met quarterly with that group. They helped design parts of the sort of like how you come in um, and really trying to fit what the needs were. So at the time when we started, 
youth services ended at 21. We purposely went up to 26 to catch people who are aging out of youth services. Obviously, since then, youth services tend to go up to 24. We then have bumped up to 28. We're thinking of going up to 30. Again, we're trying to catch people as like that last step before before they you know before they can transition to being like fully out of programming and out of subsidies. Um, so yeah, we I started in, in the city. It started. Um, very much of a city initiative that was subcontracting to two different nonprofits. So uh, it worked in the sense of like getting something up at scale. So we started 100 people a year in the first year very quickly um, because we know that government is great in many ways, but they not as agile in terms of like procuring tokens, like public transportation passes, things that you just need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it worked to get it up off the ground. Uh, it worked to sort of really convene all the different departments and heads of departments, as well as the frontline uh, city workers to figure out what are the projects that you want us to work on? How do we translate that into the crews? Um, but ultimately with a mayoral transition coming up, we need to streamline our, our administrative practice. We had staff on three different payrolls. And so really the reason to pull it out was really about streamlining um, the, just, the just organizational structure of it. So at this point, there's a subcon, there's a, so we have our AmeriCorps uh, funding still goes to the city. So it's still city of initiative. It then gets subcontracted out to a single nonprofit that's Education Works. Um, and then we, Education Works then has MOUs with water and parks and rec and some other departments for fee for service contracts that they're paying into for us to do those like on the ground projects. On top of that, our, you know, our Department of Human Services, our Office of Public Safety paid in match money to that AmeriCorps grant. And then on top of that, Education works. I do a, fun, a ton of extra funding um, to supplement it. So to give you a sense of, you know, when you think of you want to marry, we have workforce investment board dollars that we're marrying to the AmeriCorps grant um, on top of the fee for service from city departments who are taking operational dollars that they normally spend on contractors and redoing that, um, and then foundation funding. So we tie all that together in a nice package called Power Core. Um, but really, that early, that early, that early work, my entire job the first 18 months was just corralling that map uh, that Wynn showed us. And, and really my job changed every six months since we got to a different place in the project. But I think it's super important to think through, you know, who can do that work and it helped to have an internal person to the city to do it, right? So I could I could have the commissioner of water and the head of probation in the same room together. They probably never met before, but they're meeting about this specific thing. And we could work out some of those, those kinks behind the scenes of saying like, okay, now we need HR to activate on these things. You know, they're just unique processes within city government. So if you're trying to get trainees into city employment, you need to know what they are and work through those kinks and things like that. Um, and then just a little bit of, of the pathways. Uh, Gerald spoke to it, but if you're not going into, primarily it's water, streets, and our parks department that we see folks go into city employment through, um, but also private sector contractors, um, or like I said, if people want to pivot out of those, our industry focuses, we work with them individually. They all, every young person gets sort of three staff people assigned to them. So their crew leader, who's their daily coach, their motivator, their supervisor, um, a workforce development uh, career counselor, and then a supportive services counselor who, who Jasmine oversees to work on sort of like basic needs or moving barriers. How can you be successful at power for? Um, and so through that, they're triangulating with that young person, like how you want to progress through that. But like I said, we, when you look at that map, we're taking folks who are already connected to some services, but are ready for the next thing. And then we are, so are developing a whole set of employers network, including unions that were saying, okay, when they come out of this, based on the training that we've designed with you, you know, where do they map from there? So it's trying to do, do sort of that type of thing. Um, I feel like you asked a lot of questions about city, like the city, uh, but I'm happy to be more specific. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's definitely, as you're getting this off the ground, think through the stakeholder committees that you're gonna need to have, to have those conversations with, to have that process with, to work through some of those things. And I'd say that uh, there's a nice test case in Buffalo that we're, we're actually on contract right now with Buffalo Sioux Authority to help them work through with technical assistance, what that all looks like there. So I think that, um, I am not happy to put you in touch with, with Paul Harris over there to talk through like what they just started this in January. So what their experience is like to, to start um, working through some of those city processes. Great. Thank you so much. That's definitely um, my time used up. I have a million more questions, but I, I know there's lots of folks here. I really appreciate all of that detail. I think it's, it's the detail that's going to enable us to do something like what you've done. And, uh, and I just want to highlight that I appreciate you referenced just now the sort of wraparound services you provide to support 
um, the young people, because it's all like, it's all for naught if people don't actually move forward, right, on these pathways. That's, that's the piece we're really trying to achieve. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence. Of course, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wu. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really exciting um, to be able to get into the weeds a little bit. I want to zoom out just for my question. Um, you know, we've, we've heard now about some um, mappings that have already been done, which is amazing. I, I want to have that, that flow chart and all those arrows um, about the various pieces and how to convene all different potential stakeholders. And I'm just curious if we were just to try to really simplify things, what are kind of the first one, two, maybe three steps that you would recommend Boston does now? Like, is it to identify the funding? Is it to really sort of convene within City Hall, the core group that's gonna be um, sort of at the center of the public side of things? Is it to start the external stakeholder conversations? Um, I'm curious what you would sort of prioritize in terms of big picture first steps. Yeah, I, th I think you named them all, Councillor. So, um... So I think definitely getting the internal city working group up and running to start to spec what are those projects that you'd want crew trainee crews like this to operate on and start to work through, you know, what that scope could look like um, and what what needs and, and another information uh, internal to city you would need to have those those crews be operational on city projects. Um, I think that's one I think two to your point about sourcing and funding. Um, really looking at, you know, what are the opportunities to either bring an AmeriCorps grant to the city of Boston or to work with uh, a, a local nonprofit that potentially already has an AmeriCorps grant that they could add on to. So I think really identifying that will give you some core funding to then add on to um, and be really have a robust sort of like package of resources. Um, so I'd say that, that those two are, I would say are the first two steps. Um, and then concurrently, you know, thinking through uh, you know, are there are there local adaptations in terms of targeted recruitment um, demographics? Are there um, sort of you know like what are the what are the very specifics to Boston um, in terms of getting the word out and how you would recruit folks in and what your what your focus might be? So for example, in Buffalo, it's from two very specific neighborhoods, um, and so in Boston, you might you might identify that to be a certain age range or, or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, start to start to, I'd say the third thing is just to really start to focus on how you get the word out into those communities that we found in the pandemic. We have, at this point, we have over 600 alumni. We get a lot of applications through word of mouth from our alumni, but even in the pandemic recruitment has been very hard across the board in Philadelphia. Um, and so I think really making sure that you're getting connections into where you want to target your recruitment, I would say which is your third step. Thank you. Um, does that, uh, anyone else have any other ideas on that front? I mean, I'll just reinforce the 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 champions, right? I mean, you need <laughs> you need folks like like Gerald and Julia, those that are going to be really persistent. I mean, it's a it, it's a hard program, right? I mean, there's there's barriers throughout. There's you know you're going to have some some issues, um, but these folks just provided. Uh, uh, relentlessness, uh, persistence, um, and just phenomenal mentoring. So, uh, you know, you can put all the logistics together, but if, if you don't have key people in key places to, to ensure its success, then it, then it won't be successful. So um, you really just need, uh, you need, you need some champions um, throughout, not just the city government, but the, the whole process. Um, and again, a lot of credit to Gerald and, and what he did for um, you know, uh, just empowering and inspiring this, this, you know, the folks that he was working with to, to see the bigger picture. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it just takes, takes good people to make great programs successful. Thank you. And then just for our um, beloved city folks and quasi city folks, just it, it, how does that map onto how you are thinking about it already? Maybe, um, you know, uh, existing types of working groups or structures that you think might be appropriate to match up with this or any other thoughts, um, just given what our advisors have said. Yeah, thanks, Councilor. I think I, for that answer, I'll defer to uh, Trin in the Office of Workforce Development, just because she already has existing programs. So she can talk about either scaffolding up or creating a new system. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say I apologize for being late. I had to um, attend this meeting at nine o'clock. Um, so uh, one, I want to thank uh, Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley 
um, uh, for continuing to do this work. Councillor Wu, um, you know, you all, you all have been doing this work for quite some time. Forgive me if I have left any other councillors out um, because my screen is very limited. Um, I want to also acknowledge Councillor Baker, who is on here. He's uh, one of our trustees for the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust. And he has been uh, really supportive of our city academy work and many uh, programs that are intertwined with the in uh, the green infrastructure, clean energy uh, industry as well. Um, Jerry, Gerald, Julia, and Wynn, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I can have like another PhD listening and learning from all of you. Um, you know, your expertise is just immense. And as, as much as I say that I'm, I've been studying and examining this field for the last 15 years, there's always something new to learn because of the new technology landscape and the way things have changed. Uh, and now with this remote learning and um, technology, that's going to change um, as well. But I, I, I want to just briefly highlight some of the work that 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 we've been uh, doing in the city of Boston with our partners. And, um, you know, forgive me if I'm leaving some major partners and uh, efforts out just because of uh, time's sake, but happy to follow up. So a couple of quick things that we have been working uh, with the Boston Building Trades um, uh, for the last 10 to 12 years on racially diversifying their workforce. And within the trades, I, I think people don't um, uh, market it enough, but within each trades, they have a particular um, green efficiency technology component, which they retrain their members consistently. So those, those certifications are embedded in their uh, training modules. Um, I, I don't think we think about it or talk about it so much, but um, once you get into the weeds, they do have existing infrastructures already. So we have built pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeship um, programs around that. Um, the second piece that I, I think we don't highlight enough in the city, and it's probably my fault, because it's always my, my fault, is our um, tuition-free community college program that works with six uh, programs, um, six schools uh, throughout the city. And within those, uh, within those two-year colleges and community colleges, they have particular disciplines, uh, degrees, and certifications that lead to associate um, that leads to associate degrees, and then combines them with work experience. And we know how important that is for low-income students and those who are uh, working. Um, multiple jobs make ends meet while they're obtaining their post-secondary education as well. Specific programs, for example, called the BEAMS program that's been around for quite some time, the Asian American Civic Association. They have a building energy efficient, uh, efficiency maintenance skills program that works to train uh, with uh, certifications and lead, um, lead them into uh, employer tracks. <clears throat> The Roxbury Community College Center for Smart Building Technology have worked uh, to launch it with Youth Build and our Greater Boston American Apprenticeship Initiatives, um, which really works with students of color, high school students to provide them with certifications and into uh, career pathways in the smart building technology infrastructure. Um, also here that, uh, that our rock star is Co Codman Square NDC Green Infrastructure Program. Um, so um, there are great um, partners uh, within the ecosystem in the city of Boston that we can definitely optimize and learning from all the partners from Gerald, Julia and Wynn, I mean, the key is to integrate some of these best practices so that we can go to scale. Uh, just two things that I've been hearing and they're only um, limited to two because of this presentation, but a couple, a few challenges in terms of nuts and bolts, because I know a lot of people have been talking about that. Because at the end of the day, we don't want plans. We don't just want plans and plans and visions. We want to see how we operationalize it to get the outcomes and the uh, intended results that we want. So one is the cost per participant and the cost structure is really a little more complicated than people think. So the budget, and I think Julia had alluded to this, the budget has to be understood, simplified from an operation standpoint. 
Uh, we do have various AmeriCorps programs and sometimes they don't work well because of the restrictions. So having unrestricted funds to cover gaps so that partners who are really good at what they're doing can do their job so that um, they can focus on less administrative burden and more on the program participants and their skill set. Um, and I can say more about the budget piece a little later or offline. The second piece that we all know that's an elephant in the room is that employers, you know, we can't do what's what's the use of workforce training and certifications and all this hard work that students get into if they don't have a good paying job with a career pathway at the end of the day. And so I see my colleague here, uh, John Sullivan from the Boston Water Sewer, for example. I mean, they have been an instrumental partner in hiring at uh, from our City Academy program. It doesn't necessarily focus on green uh, infrastructure or clean e energy, but it does have components of best practices that we can integrate into the, the, the field. Um, and so, um, you know, employer engagement from private, uh, I think Councillor Bach had mentioned it, nailed it. It's just also the private industry as well. I mean, Eversource, National Grid, uh, subcontractors, GCs, a variety of private uh, employers uh, have a demand for those jobs. Um, uh, the public sector, not just city, but we have to also look at the state and the, the federal government as well. The state mass, uh, mass dot is uh, a very um, engaged employer of ours to hire our graduates. Um, the airport is also important. So we have to see um, the green, in my opinion, uh, we have to see the uh, green infrastructure jobs or clean energy as a field within a growing larger existing infrastructure instead of creating a new one, because that's the only way in which we can cap, get a hold of the hiring market. So um, it'll give more opportunities for our graduates to apply for a lot of these jobs that are available. Uh, I think I'm talking too much. It's just a, bit, a, a little bit of my thoughts in um, hearing uh, from you all. Love to um, answer additional questions offline. Um, and uh, follow up with the work. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Trin. Uh, Councilor Wood, do you have more questions? No, I'm good. I was gonna say I'm good. Thank you so much for that. Perfect. And, and uh, we're gonna go to Councilor Braden uh, in a minute for uh, because she was next, but Councilor Baker, do you have a quick question for Trin? I, I did, Trin, thank you for, for touching on the, um, on the, um, the budget aspect of it, because that's what the devil is in the details if we if we could figure out a budget. But I just had one question, and I'm sorry if I missed it. The industry academies, are those city run or those nonprofits? Those are city run uh, because- Oh no, I was, I was talking to Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia oh, I'm, sorry. I'm, so I'm sorry. They're, um, they, the city subcontracts with the nonprofit to run it, but they are designed to the- Three are designed directly with city departments, so they're on city projects. Yeah. Okay. So it, so that's all a nonprofit thing. They're not in city buildings or anything like that. It's that's totally funded, but funded by the city with the nonprofits. Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Councilor Baker. We'll, we'll come back to you after uh, Councilor Braden. Uh, but Councilor Braden, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. This is a lot of information to digest. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Um, I, I'm curious about um, the returning citizens aspect. Um, is there um, a pathway to, um, I'm really impressed with your, your the recidiv recidivism, I can never say that, uh, recidivism rates and how, how, how impressive um, those numbers are. Um, in terms of long-term uh, employment, uh, what's your success in, 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 with those um, returning citizens uh, going out into other jobs or do they stay within city jobs? Yeah, I would say, so at the point that people are graduating out of Power Core, there's no difference whether you have a record or not in terms of your success. So at the point that you graduate, you know, we're seeing similar outcomes across the board. We have, frankly, we have folks who are still in the water department six, seven years later, they've been promoted 
up through the system. They're, you know, now a full on electrician one within the civil service at the water treatment plant. Um, folks are staying in their jobs. In, in some cases, obviously they're switching careers. So they might have been at a contractor for two years and then are ready to, to change it up. Um, a big part of our ethos is that if you're an alumni, you have lifetime alumni services. You can come back, get career counseling appointments. We often have employers come to us with jobs that we can't fill with recent graduates. So we'll put it out to our alumni pool. And so folks who are looking to switch careers will often do that. Um, but also as we've built out new training tracks, we invite alumni back in. So we didn't used to run solar. So if that's something people wanted to pivot into, they would come back as alumni, go through that track and then go to solar. But you know, we're finding people are staying well over a year, oftentimes several more years, both within the city, um, folks are very loyal. Once they get in the city, they're staying in the city. Uh, with private sector, it just depends on, you know, your life at that point in time. Um, but like I said, we have folks who are five, six, seven years in the city at this point. And um, in terms of um, entrepreneurship, um, are, there, are there programs to help um, interested parties, um, you know, develop their own business plan and, and become entrepreneurs with uh, maybe your more experienced folks. Is there is there help and support for that? Yeah, I think you're you're spot on. It's been it's been a bunch. I think Gerald actually was a a leader in pushing us to say like, hey, you know, this is an emerging industry. Your folks are getting this training. You know, they they could be owning their own. They could be contractors for the water department themselves. I think we have partnered at different points in time with very specific alumni who are interested in that. We have a couple who own their own contracting businesses now. Um, but I think to your point, you're spot on. Um, that that's something we've been looking to bring back to our alumni pool is sort of like a, as a hey, you've been in you've been in the industry a couple of years now. Here we can bring in resources. For example, in the pandemic, we brought in a financial advisor that would meet with folks one on one to sort of talk through how you amplify the dollars you're earning. I think the similar thing that you're getting at is we can bring in experts in the field to say like, if you want to come, you know, we can, we can pay for you to go through these classes to start your own business. I think it's a huge goal of ours. It just hasn't been operationalized fully yet. Okay. And in terms of recruitment, um, do you do, do you do outreach to um, high, you know, high schools as, and to get people interested in this career path as they're thinking, you know, before they're leaving school, but you know, ahead of time? Yeah, so we'll, we'll be at the, you know, the career fairs at high schools, at community events, um, and working directly with counselors within schools. Specifically, we have an agricultural high school as well as career and technical education high schools. But um, again, anywhere that will let us in, we, we come, we bring members like Samir and Ali, and, and we pitch them as hard as we can. So we're, we're, we're out there recruiting as much as we can. Very good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Baker, do you have further questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you everybody from Philly for, um, you know, sitting here with us and just sharing your, your knowledge and your experience. Uh, I just had a quick, maybe a couple of questions for, for John and Ryan. Like, would you, John, it, like, do you have infrastructure improvements? Like, do you have an inventory of infrastructure improvements you'd be able to hit the ground running with and, 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 you know, keep, keep people busy? Right now we, we contract out uh, the work that are required to uh, maintain this infrastructure. The ones we build, we do it for three years and we're turning them back over the city. Yeah. Um, and there aren't that many. We, we treat it a little different than what Philly has. Um, we haven't done as much as the visual green infrastructure. We're really big on infiltration underground systems, matching the great kind of uh, operation with the beauty of green infrastructure. However, we recognize the need for additional trees in front of our building at Harrison Avenue. We have a, a green infrastructure system with a whole bunch of trees. You know, we don't, we, we don't own the tree, but the tree's working with our system uh, to work. It helps with the heat island. We, we mustn't forget the whole heat island issue as a city we need to deal with. However, when we implement our stormwater fee, we know of over 2,000 uh, infiltration systems in the city already constructed, we've got the dashboard, that will need to be confirmed that they're working. And the way we intend on doing it is that the private individual that wants to get a discount on the fee would hire an independent um, group to come in and verify to us that in fact the system is there and it's working. So that would create a jobs creation process. It would They would pay individually to have it certified every three years or so. Uh, we'd have to make sure the cost is low, but that would confirm to us that we could reduce their fee 
because they're helping us meet our goals. Yeah. So on those infrastructure um, infrastructure projects, do you, do do your engineers design those? Are they all privately designed, and you guys just have a sign off on them? We we've done both. We've designed yeah. them. Uh, we have the outside engineers design them uh, throughout the city. There's all kinds, and we have them modified them because the key we have is maintenance people forget you can build the most beautiful thing in the world if you can't maintain it in three or four years you're going to get to build it again yeah so would you would you use would you <clears throat> use would you be able to use workers to to um maintain this sort of stuff is that something it, you're looking to do or not really or well i think we're looking to do it in conjunction with public works and parks if we yeah. build streetscapes and with all the work, you know, we can help with the capital so that it's taking care of our obligation. Then all of a sudden we have some trees. We're really bad at keeping trees alive. Um, so we need the parks and their expertise and those people to work it. They don't have the maintenance crews. So between us, Public Works, who has the obligation for the street drainage along with us and parks, together we need to find a way to fund this. And my own idea is I like the idea of independent outside groups doing it, not necessarily someone on the payroll. Um, our problem with the payroll, whenever it comes to cut, what do you look to cut first? Yeah. Whereas if I have a contract and I'm only using them so many months a year, it's a fixed cost. I know what my costs are. And then when we reevaluate fees, we can reevaluate that. So we are thinking of this, we're, we're getting ready to put this together. Not that I want to have everybody so excited about another fee in the city, but this is the way, so it isn't all carried on your sewer charges. Yeah. Those that have the big areas would pay the appropriate fee. And I think Philadelphia itself has a fee. Um, I know DC does. I know Seattle does. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. correct. And if I can just add on to, to, to John's points here too, I think we've heard this a few times. We, you know, we as, as you know, water utility, we want civil service, right? We want to increase our workforce. Uh, we want to have the skill set on board. But clearly, you've heard examples now of the the, the professional service contracts um, that that we you know we fund as well. You know these the the members of, of PowerCore are working for those firms, right? And and if we're getting into more um, regulations based, you know, uh, uh, stormwater infrastructure, there are requirements on on the private entities to maintain, and they're going to need a workforce. So those are instances where we're not directly paying for that that maintenance. But we're requiring it, and we expect it to occur in order to to meet our regulatory objectives. So um, the opportunities are plenty, and I think you have to look at it from that broader lens, right? I mean, as a public utility, we're not going to say, uh, you know, we're going to hire a hundred people in the next year or so to do this. Yeah. You know, to John's point, but but we're investing in individuals that can help us throughout the entire chain, whether it's enforcement, regulations, you know, uh, and, and again, it's not even just maintenance. I mean. Think about the ambassador nature, right? The communication nature. We can have folks on site during construction who understand what it is we're building that can communicate with the neighborhood, right? They're neighborhood ambassadors as well. They don't need to just be maintenance. We can get involved in light design or light construction as well. Um, so, I mean, it's really just about uh, uh, giving opportunities to our residents and, and connecting them to investments that we need to make. Um, so thinking about it from all the different delivery you know, elements is really important and that again, not just public works costs, but how do you actually start to, to connect them with you know, private development where we have operations and maintenance agreements, right? That are deeded to the site. Um, they're required to maintain. Um, who's doing that maintenance? Some of them are gonna be alum of Power Corps because they've had the experience and they've gone through the program. So um, yeah, just think about all the different folks that could take advantage of, uh, a, a, of a burgeoning you know, workforce. Um, and, and there's a lot out there. Yeah, I mean, this conversation is 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 equal parts um, environment and job training, which is areas we, we need improvement in both. So good conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for running this. Of course. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, Councilor Braden, do you have a brief question? Oh, just a back? comment. Uh, when we had our when we had our list of industries and, and entities in the city who could benefit from this uh, program, I, I think it would be remiss to forget our nonprofit sector, our hospitals and our universities, which have a huge footprint in the city of Boston. And I know Harvard is, is doing a lot of work on this green infrastructure because they're in the floodplain of the Charles River. 
and um, you know they're, they're leaders really but it is a, a best kept secret and uh, I think they, they as well might be another source of play, for uh, work job placements and and experience to cultivate this this new workforce thank you good point okay, uh, okay. You. pardon me Matt Yes. Hi. Uh, so this is Gerald. I had some technical difficulties earlier, but there was some. Uh, you're still having them. Yeah. But I, I wasn't on, online at the time. Uh, Gerald, we're, we're getting every other word. I heard technical difficulties and then online. Um, I, can you... Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Um, so. I wanted to really just grab a comment for John there. Sure. Uh, so John, you know, we spoke a lot about the landscaping or the surface maintenance that we do using PowerCore. Um, but, you know, one thing I didn't speak to is the way that Philadelphia systems are designed. So all of our systems uh, typically have a, a subsurface component. Um, it's, it's only, you know, maybe about 50 to 60% that have the vegetated component. So uh, we've all, we have inlets, we have subsurface piping, we do pre-treatment maintenance on all of our inlets, filter baskets and such. Um, so I wanted to mention though that PowerCore has been instrumental and in also helping to supplement um, our inlet cleaning crews. Um, we also have crews that go out and do subsurface CCTV inspection. And we've had PowerCore uh, members come in as apprentices in our, in our flow control unit, and they've learned how to, you know, work at instrumentation and are now, uh, you know, in several service titles working uh, with CCTV inspection on inlet cleaning trucks or some of the flushing trucks that maintain our, our subsurface assets. So I just want to throw that out there as another potential. Um, it's not just a landscaping piece and where we're using them. So I want to just mention that to you. No, that, that's great. Uh, I appreciate that and the, uh, also the ability to vacuum uh, any of the surfaces we have that the sand and salt get on. Um, that's something we have contracted out, but we would look at that for permeable sidewalks, permeable pavement, or other such things. City Hall Plaza will have the largest permeable paved surface than anyone has ever seen when they get through with it. That's great. You know, we, will, we will invite our, our colleagues from Philly up to the City Hall uh, Plaza unveiling. I think it should be ne next summer, right, John? Summer. Sure. Uh, if everything, if, if uh, Mr. Cook keeps everything online, it will be. Excellent. Well done. Um, good. All right. We uh, to come to Austin and visit. And likewise, likewise, we'd love if you guys wanted to visit and check out our operation. Uh, Chief Cook and I never miss an excuse to go visit another city when invited. So uh, as soon as it's safe to do so, and I'm seeing a, a lot of uh, heads nodding uh, in agreement. So we'll, we'll all be coming down, God willing, this summer or fall. Um, we're going, uh, I, Kent, I see your hand raised. We're actually, you are up next uh, from some of the advocates. Uh, again, the, the purpose is just if you have a statement, but if you also have questions for any of the panelists, but before we get to you, just wanted to see if Councillor Bach or Councillor Wu had any um uh, for the questions or if we should just continue and go right into the advocates? No, I think it'd be great to go to the advocates just because we've got a bunch of folks. I mean, I should let Councillor Wu say anything she wants to say, but that, that's my instinct. Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So um, I know David Meshalam, I believe, had to leave. Um, so we're going to have Ken Jackson from the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, followed by Parker James of the Charles Gate Alliance, uh, and then Pat Alvarez of Southwest Boston CDC. Uh, so Kent, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate uh, everybody convening this <coughs> conversation in this group. So we at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy for over 10 years have provided um, programs for teens 15 to 18 that are specific to maintenance of our parks. So it's, you know, deadheading, it's pruning, it's basic plant maintenance, it is um, plant bed maintenance, it's planting, it is invasive removal. We also have a program that is specific to environmental education, giving them information about certain science concepts, as well as giving them the uh, skills to then go out and to perform um, presentations to other youth. And we also have a nature connection component where we believe getting our teens involved in nature first will help them, to give them the desire to work in the green industries. And my question from the folks from Philadelphia is, do you have do you have partners with, or do you find it, you need to have partners with youth serving organizations that serve as a feeder into your program? 
So about 50% of our recruitment comes uh, from either youth serving or social services agencies that feed into our program. And then the other half is open to the public and often comes through word of mouth of, from our alumni themselves. And do, do you require any type of specific training? Let's say they have to have had a year with horticulture or arboriculture or, you know, um, green infrastructure, or is it just open to folks who are interested? It's open to anyone. So, um, and the, the only requirement we do have is a uh, high school diploma or GED very specifically because we're working with employers and we don't want that to be a barrier. If you're otherwise ready for employment, we wanna make sure you have that before you start with us. Um, but for that specific reason, we partner a lot with high schools, alternative high schools, other um, folks who are GED providers, um, but really it's open to anyone. We'll train you from the, from the jump and get you up to speed. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kent. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to navigate two screens here. So I'm gonna read the names the way I have them. Um, I, and if I don't believe pe folks are in the waiting room, if they are, we will uh, admit you. Um, is Parker James or Pat Alvarez with us? Yes, I'm Pat Alvarez here. Hi, Pat. Um, okay, if you want to um, go right ahead and then is Perla Lara with you uh, as yes. well, Pat? I think she okay. is, or she was. Yeah, she's here somewhere. And then okay, David so Queely. I, I just had a couple. Of, this has been really interesting and informative and helpful. I just, mostly for city council members, I wanted to just stress a couple of issues. One is, you know, I hope that the way we can design our program um, can serve both kids who are having this as their first work experience and may not end up long-term going into um, this kind of work, but it's just as valuable and critical for them. We notice particularly that the 15 and 16 year olds are really not future oriented yet. Their minds are just on their life right now. So we try to provide them with as much job readiness training, you know, uh, life skills training to prepare them for whatever job. We find that the 17 and 18 year olds are, are more thinking about the future so we're exposing them to college opportunities, but also environmental careers. So we just hope that that can be understood however the program is designed, that there's, there, even if kids aren't gonna, we hope that they'll get interested in this work and feed into adult training programs. But even if they don't, I think there's still a huge value to having the kids who live in our city get, get good solid job readiness training and life skills training because they're gonna be living in our city forever and we want them to succeed and do well. Um, the other thing I, I, I guess I'm wondering about is um, the environmental education piece of it, not just teaching them how to do the work, but teaching them what's happening in, in our environment that makes this work so critical. We need that component um, as well in our program. So those are my, those are my thoughts as I was listening. Um, as listening, and I hope that that all that is that you know all that that needs to happen for very young young kids can get really um, the support that it needs. I appreciate that, Pat, and obviously agree with you. I, I think the beauty of this is this is sort of the second step with the working session, as you know. So as we continue to sort of flesh things out, that certainly will be. Um, at the forefront uh, of our minds and, and as we as we sort of begin the, the next steps. Um, is, uh, did Perla have some remarks as well? Um, and again, I'm sorry, I'm trying to navigate a couple screens here, so I'm not sure. Perla, are you there? Okay. Hi, I'm here. Oh, please, um, yes. I, I think she covered everything really well. I think, you know, I want to echo that point about the younger youth who are going to be, um, I mean, I guess that's still a question of whether that we're starting this at age 15, 16, because that is something that we evaluate at the end of our trainings, at the end of our summer, um, where they find the actual work inviting and like exciting. But when we do trainings about like, uh, you know, invite them, them attorney general's office to teach them about things when you turn 18, taxes, stuff like that. Like Pat was saying, we do job readiness, life skills beyond um, 
just what they're doing on hand in the field now. Um, and so those youth do tend to be a little bit more narrow sighted about uh, just earning some cash for the summer, making some friends, you know, being outdoors. Um, so making it a program that uh, will still engage them and teach them new things um, while targeting the older kids as well and helping them lead into what we eventually want uh, career oriented things. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Perla. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, I'm going to briefly turn the gavel over to my vice chair, uh, Councilor Wu. I've sent her the name of the uh, of the other advocates who will speak, and I will be back in uh, about five minutes. So, uh, Councilor Wu, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, so I see next on the list uh, from our chair, David Queeley, but I actually don't... Councilor Wu, he had to go. I have a question okay. from him that I was going to share with the group, but I'm oh, happy wonderful. to wait until after the other advocates who are here, just since they're waiting. Okay, or whatever you prefer. That sounds great, Councilor Bach. Um, so let's see. Danilo Morales. Um, looking on. Oh, and we have some folks in the waiting room, too. Okay, hold on. Let me bump a few folks. I don't see Danilo here. Maya is next on the list. So um carrie could i get some help i actually can't bump folks from i don't have full uh host authority could we bump maya and nishela and don please into the panelist room and then madam chair i know that um karen from emerald necklace conservancy is also here already oh, in i see karen okay wonderful parker james Oh, you want me to talk? Oh, <laughs> am I on? Um, why don't I go through the, uh, yeah, yes, we can hear you. Why don't I go through the other um, three folks who are on our list and then we'll go right to you, Parker and Karen. Sure, absolutely. And then we'll go to Councillor Bach for the question from um, Danilo. So next up was Maya and that followed by Nishela, followed by Don. Hi, uh, so I'm coming from Sunrise Boston, which is the Boston hub of the Sunrise Movement, which is a national movement uh, fighting for good jobs and a livable future. And a central part of that is a Green New Deal, especially on the city level. And one thing that we really emphasize in our movement is um, the solidarity across the movement. So I was just wondering if the folks from Power Core could talk a little bit about how you center racial and economic justice in your work. And that, I mean, for us, that is our founding mission. So it's baked right into everything we do. It's why we were started. So we weren't started just to address climate issues. We were specifically started to address climate, economic, and racial equity issues. Um, but honestly, if Zamir or Ali want to speak to that, you know, I think they can speak very directly of their experience with that themselves. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Allie. I am the operational support fellow at PowerCore. Uh, I guess to speak to that, just in our entire demographic, every cohort, um, just being alongside people and hearing everyone's story, uh, most people come from uh, these issues that you're asking that we address, um, come from and pop impoverished communities in Philadelphia. Um, most people are people of color. Uh, most people, uh, not most people, but a lot of us uh, have dealt with or have similar barriers when it comes to like the criminal justice system and Power Corps also has made it, especially with, um, you know, everything happening a few months ago when it came to like George Floyd and everything has made it, um, very important to address these things and make sure that their uh, members know that these things are important to us. Um, and especially when it comes to our workforce development, that within itself is just a boost um, to these demographics and making sure that they're, oops, sorry, that's my phone. I'm important right now. Um, and making sure that we are not just ready, but ahead of the game that's something that uh, I've been doing a lot of like recruitment and intakes and letting people know that Power Corps not only just gets you ready, but boosts you ahead of so many people, even people who have degrees, um, accolades on top of accolades, 
uh, boost you ahead of people without having to spend money that people may not have because they're coming from these demographics and barriers. Um, so I guess maybe that helps address that. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Ali with that. Um, from my experience with Power Core, um, you get to meet a lot of people with experiences that you probably never experienced. So um, throughout the, the year and a half that I've been here, I met so many people who just changed my life on a personal level, just because like, it's their experiences that they went through in their life and seeing them still come to work every day and still fight and still persevere every day. It's just like, it's inspiring just to work with so many different people. Um, and if I could just add one more thing, one of the things that makes Power Core so great um, is, uh, I guess the term, it's a, I don't know if it's just a Philly term, I guess spinning the block. Uh, a lot of people who don't, aren't quite ready for power core, they aren't just shunned. It might not be your time for power core is what they like to say a lot. Um, and those members who are like exited, if they finally are ready at a later time, can attempt to return um, after having a conversation with culture and climate and making sure that they have addressed and progressed in certain areas that they struggled before, um, which, you know, coming from these communities and coming from certain environments, a lot of people, when they come to Power Core at first, they're not ready um, for workforce development. They're not ready to build these bonds and being able to come back and say, okay, I've grown a little bit and I'm ready and have those welcome arms that they might not get at home, they might not have those supports and have those supports available about Power Core. Uh, it's just priceless um, and again, adds to, uh, you know, boosting these demographics that definitely need to be. Thank you. And then I just had one more question if there's time. Um, so we have a really strong network of organizers, uh, climate, racial justice, economic justice, organized labor in Boston. And a lot of us tend to work together on issues that are related on what uh, Power Corps works on. I was wondering if in Philly, you work with community organizations or advocacy groups within the city, and if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we really see ourselves as part of the, the larger community, larger fabric. So we're constantly you know, engaging new partners. We'll do projects with community-based farms, for example. Um, we'll work on advocacy together. We're part of a national advocacy group um with the core networks i think you know we we want to do our part to the to i mean it's part of why we're here today is like we're happy for this to spread as much as possible thank you everyone thank you Councillor Wu. ali are you speak i think you're muted you're good okay wonderful thank you very much maya um next Nishela, I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I'm, I apologize. Hi, my name is Nishela Porter. I'm with the Charles River Watershed Association. Um, I think the Philadelphia Power Core program is very exciting. Um, and it's great that Boston is taking steps to bridge the racial wealth gap by presenting opportunities for underrepresented communities to be involved. Uh, with the growing jobs in green infrastructure and stormwater investment. Um, CRWA is currently facilitating green infrastructure trainings through our GI ambassador program. Um, and we have created a partnership with the Excel Conservation Corps to train young professionals for careers in water management and conservation that lead to economic self-sufficiency. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, um, and you know, you talked a little bit about it, um, is how the Conservation Corps will incorporate existing programs and trainings to capture currently engaged youth and utilize existing materials. Um, so that's like one comment, but I'm also curious if you found as you develop the curriculum specifically with the GI program with the water department and then refined it with the private sector, if there were certifications that were required for permanent place work placement. 
I think I can take the second one. Um, so because it's a it's a largely a, a economy that is driven by the water department, uh, you know, we we you know train to the specs of the GI manual maintenance manual that they put out. Um, and in Philly, uh, certain certifications were not required or not needed. That said, like I said, our work in Boston for them, the GICP certification is their is their gold standard, and so we we are working to train towards that curriculum. So I think it really there these are regional economies, right? So like like even the plan ID that you need to know is different per region. So I think it's really we take our cues from the employer, so that's how we we adapt our curriculum. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wu, are you, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Next was Don Sands, and then um, we'll move back to Parker and Karen. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Don Sands. I'm co-founder and executive director of Excel Education here in Boston. Um, we started uh, the Excel Conservation Corps here in Boston two and a half years ago. Uh, so we're much younger than um, Power Corps. Um, but we are working in the green infrastructure and, and water, uh, wastewater um, sector. So uh, we recruit um, young adults, um, 18 to 29 year olds, unemployed and underemployed, uh, primarily uh, young adults of color here in Boston. Um, and we prepare, we, we do uh, water conservation projects, work projects that are paid um, in collaboration with Charles River Water Association and other environmental groups in the area. Um, and we also, um, do classes in-house uh, to prepare them for their wastewater license uh, here in Massachusetts so they can get a job as a, a wastewater um, operator, which pays very well um, here in Massachusetts. And um, so this was a great presentation and I'm really, was really excited to hear everything they're doing at Power Corps. Um, I'd like to just um, encourage um, uh, those of us in Boston to um, focus on a few areas that I think they're doing super well. So I love the fact that they're doing multiple tracks. I think we should include multiple tra tracks in what we do here in Boston. Um, that, that has two benefits. One is that uh, not everyone's going to have the same interest of what career they want to go into. So you're going to recruit a much larger body, but also it, it enables you to place a lot more people into, into well-paying careers. Um, those of us that are doing the work now in wastewater, uh, we, we're not able to place 100 people into wastewater. There's just not that many jobs available for a year. So having a lot more, uh, having multiple tracks, you're going to be able to place many more people into careers. Um, I think it's really crucial that you have um, city department commitment. Um, that was clear from uh, what Gerald shared. And I know that you did, that um, being able to do that, you'll be able to place a lot of these young people of color into well-paying uh, city jobs in the city of Boston, which is really important. Um, right now um, with the Excel Conservation Corps, most of our placements are with private companies that are operating wastewater plants. So having that um, opening in the city is, I think, really important. I love the fact that they're doing paid training work. We do the same thing. I think when you're working with this population of young adults, they have expenses have to support themselves. So having the training being paid is, is crucial, but it also raises the cost of the program per participant so that you have to take that into consideration. I love the fact that they're doing more than just, they may have started, but they're not doing just trash removal or landscaping. They're doing much more in-depth work that involves um, you know, data collection and involves um, higher level thinking skills, which I think is really important for this population as to focus on higher level skills. And we do that at Excel. Um, I think um, having uh, both public and private placements um, for economic equity leading to well-paying careers is really important. Um, we don't wanna just give people jobs where they're having a great experience, but when they finish, they don't have the skills or the certification to be able to go into a well-paying career that has advancement opportunities. And working for the city, working for the union, working in a, a wastewater, for example, or, or water distribution, drinking water, those are well-paying careers. They have opportunities to move up a ladder, get higher licensures, and, and it leads to a middle-class career. And I think that should be the goal if we're really interested in economic equity. Um, so th those are those are my comments. I, I think that all those the presentation is really awesome, and I think if we can, can can try to incorporate a lot of those aspects that they're doing at Power Core into our model, I think that will really lead to success. And I don't know, Julie, if you have any comments on that, but I just I was very impressed. Thank you. No, I think you're spot on, Dan. 
Hey, Bright, thank you. And if I could, this is Gerald Bright um, speaking here. Um, Don, you mentioned the data collection. That had that was something that was very, very important to us. Um, I'm not sure if you saw it word present earlier in the presentation, but you know, I, I mentioned how we were a very, very small unit that was tasked with large responsibilities. Uh, we started with three, four admins and a handful of contractors. So when we brought on Power Core, it was still very much, um, you know, it, it was a big ask. It was very new to the department. So we thought, you know, let's make sure we can prove the efficacy here. You know, and we collected a lot of data. So, you know, we didn't incorporate Power Core initially into our work order management system, but we had them collecting data. We formatted it into spreadsheets and databases. And at the end of the year, we were able to say this cohort remove, you know, 19, 20 tons, uh, you know, after a year, we were going up to hundreds of tons of year debris removed. So that data really uh, worked to support, um, you know, the, the efficacy of the program and to really show, um, you know, that, that Power Core is having a big impact, uh, you know, because, you know, you can speak to the soft skills and workforce development, but, you know, there are some of those people who want to see actual numbers um, and, and being able to report on tonnage removed was huge for us. Uh, um, great. If, if I just wanted to speak on the data part too, like, and when it comes to like being like self-sustaining and um, providing like a sense of leadership within crews, because uh, data can be a, like a lot to collect when you have multiple crews out in different areas. Um, we assign crew members roles and one of them is data collection, which is how we get a lot of our data in our foundations cohort, because there's a Google form that they fill out every day. And it's how we collect our data. I would just like to say also that we, we do data collection with our conservation core crews when they're out doing water quality testing. And I think that what's awesome about that too is is preparing them for future work they're going to have to do in the fields. Because when they get into these careers, there's a lot of data collection involved. There's a lot of sampling and, um, and data collection. And so if they can start being introduced to those skills at this point, it prepares them for the next steps um, in, this, in this field. So. Uh, thank you, everybody, and, and thank you, Councilor Wu, for uh, uh, allowing me to uh, step off for a couple of minutes. Um, so we're going to now go back to Parker James, and then I see Karen and David uh, will follow Parker. Um, but Parker, did you have a, a yeah some comments? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the city councilors. Um, it's so smart to reach out to our colleagues in Philadelphia. Um, I am a huge fan of Philadelphia, um, traveled there often, and um, am so impressed at, um, you know, the way, you know, a city with similar challenges, uh, also a different, different set of challenges, um, is responding in such creative and exciting ways. Um, and I just think it is so great for Bostonians to reach out and see a different model. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. We all got, those of us who have been listening, got so much um, out of your presentation today. Um, I'll try to keep this brief because I have so much to say. Um, first of all, thank you for, you know, I'm co-founder of the Charles Gate Alliance, but I also um, want to um, express um, support for another project, which is um, the uh, Friends of Meldina Cass Boulevard project. And, um, in both cases, I think that a Boston Conservation Corps uh, could really play an important role. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, please, city councilors, when you're um, when we're thinking about the Melania Cass Greenway, think about you know what a, a positive role the uh, Boston Conservation Corps could play to the to the Roxbury community and to um, you know improving uh, the landscape there. Melnia Cass Boulevard and um, Charles Gate are similar in that um, they have uh, jurisdictional challenges. Melnia Cass Boulevard, you know, it's open space, but it's not parkland specifically, um, and therefore um, is uh, underserved and underprotected. In the case of Charles Gate, we are Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so we're in the middle of one of the most densely um, populated part of the city, parts of the city, um, but the city government has no jurisdiction in our park. 
and instead, um, jurisdiction is in the like totally under-resourced um, uh, state level uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, which among other things provides, um, you know, they provide very limited maintenance and no trash receptacles or trash pickup. So for example, we're right by Fenway Park. We have tens of thousands of um, uh, baseball fans going to and from. Um, no place to throw anything. So I like throw it um, on our grass. Um, so, you know, Boston Conservation Corps could really help us uh, with maintenance um, and, you know, various other things. Uh, so think of trash pickup, but um, it was also really inter interesting um, to hear the Philadelphia people and also John Sullivan talk about the challenges of sort of volunteer-based green infrastructure maintenance. That's something we really want to implement at Charles Gate. And um, you know, really great to hear uh, 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 the Philadelphia experience vis-a-vis uh, -vis training, et cetera, uh, for green, green, green infrastructure maintenance. Um, so I also wanna talk about um, uh, at Charles Gate, we, um, because you know, DCR doesn't really provide um, adequate maintenance, we have contracted with a private organization called Project Place, who um, hires at-risk adults um, to do maintenance work um, uh, at various parts of the city. But it's a great, great organization. And um, although I think it's uh, fantastic, counselors, that um, there's such a strong emphasis on um, youth education here, uh, I hope that you will uh, keep in mind that there's also, you know, a large number of at-risk adults that could really benefit from being um, uh, looped in to uh, this sort of organization. I mean, there are real opportunities here. And um, so please open your mind to that. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll stop shortly. Just want to give a quick shout out to our, um, what do I want to say, our adjacent organization, the Muddy Water Initiative. Carolyn Reeves did a fantastic job um, at corralling large numbers of young volunteers to uh, do green water infrastructure maintenance at her water goat, um, which was cleaning the uh, surface of the Muddy River um, this last summer. And one of the great things that she did um, was she got a grant to hire a volunteer coordinator. And um, she ended up with more young, interesting um, Bostonians uh, working that she knew what to do with. So um, the, the, the person power is there. There's so much excitement. So uh, just please implement this and um, everything will go forward. And I've said my bit, thank you. Tell us what we can do to help, all right? Um, and I'll shut up. Thank you, Parker. Uh, no, I pre appreciate your testimony. And, and uh, to tell you, to answer your question, what you can do to help is precisely what you're doing right now. Just we're using this space to convene it. Obviously, this thing isn't as simple as we're going to, you know, flip a switch and start this tomorrow. Uh, but I think there is enormous uh, appetite and real momentum for pushing this forward as we go through our budget process and beyond. So I think that the best thing we can all do is stay in communication, figure out our best way to move forward, and uh, again, look at some best practices around the region. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Karen uh, Monty Broderick from the uh, Emerald Necklace Conservancy is next, and then followed by uh, David uh, Meshalam from Speak for the Trees. So Karen, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Karen Monty Broderick, uh, president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. I'm so glad <laughs> Kent Jackson got to um, also ask a couple of questions. I do actually have a couple of specific questions. Uh, one of them kind of goes back to the, the question that Parker has. And I, you know, the emerald necklace uh, in and of itself is 1,100 acres and it has several different owners, um, you know, uh, many, many different jurisdictions. So I'd love to hear uh, from the uh, city of Philadelphia in terms of your program, um, were you able to, you know, what percentage of your work was on city land? state land, other kind of quasi public lands versus private, you know, maybe you had agreements even with private property owners. I just kind of wanted to hear th that, if I might. Yeah, almost all of our projects are on, are on city land, public land of some sort. 
So city land, not not state land. I don't know if it's a no, just city city land. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I I would love it if we could have an agreement that we could also do state land, like Parker was saying. There's so much we can't even tell the border, frankly, between where some of the city and the state. Uh, ends. Uh, and of course, the Emerald Necklace is the first piece of green infrastructure. We just spent like, what, $60 million uh, to renovate it because we didn't take care of it, you know, for a long time. Uh, so, you know, to deal with the, the dredging and erosion issues. Um, and then one of the things that I, I would really love to know how we could partner and think about is that we have hundreds of kids that have, and young people, Boston Public School students mainly, that have gone through uh, the programs that Kent and others have been leading and all these organizations with uh, uh, Ms. Alvarez and others that we we would love to keep in touch with. We'd love to provide them these kinds of green jobs, but we hadn't had a place to send them. So I think when this program is set up, we have we have names to refer, you know, to um, the older uh, the older programs for these this job development. I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. Uh, Kenzie's furring her brow. Um, but okay, uh, because I think that there are a lot of youth that we have been training, but that we've been, it's been frustrating that there hasn't necessarily been this immediate place, except for working with forestry contractors that work, you know, in the suburbs and sometimes come into the city, you know, so that has been, unfortunately, I think there's a little, a little bit of limitation there. Um, in terms of the returning citizens work, we had a returning citizens program that, you know, um, struggled, I will say it struggled. And I guess I'd like to know, uh, from Philadelphia, how did you, did you have a main public partner that you developed your returning citizens program with? How did you, um, you know, what was your best partner? Because we've been working with the Department of Corrections and it hasn't, um, recently it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been a program that we've been able to really run in the same way as in the past. And I don't know if it was ever structured in a very good way. I think in terms of inflow in, and then I'm happy to uh, for Jasmine to talk a little bit about what adaptations we make to our own program to address sort of uh, you know common common struggles and barriers that folks have. But uh, primarily probation and parole on the county level, um, but also with reentry programs. One of them was city run. We have a, a office of reentry within city government, um, but we also have a citywide coalition of reentry providers. So. As part of that whole network, we're working with public defenders or judges with probation officers and paroles to get those referrals from folks um, to get their clients into our program. And I think if, if you're asking more about like, how do we then sort of like work with folks in, I, I think Jasmine can, can answer a little bit more of that. Good morning. It, it, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt anyone, did I? Nope. Question. Jasmine, please, the floor is yours. All right. Um, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, the services that are provided, the supportive services that are provided for everyone, but um, as they can help to um, remove barriers to successful completion of the program um, and to give people access to sustainable future employment, including returning citizens. Um, one of the components that we have in our supportive services department is um, some, some legal support. Um, and that's not necessarily like law defense, like criminal defense, but um, things like we have an expungement clinic. So for folks who have certain kinds of charges, usually misdemeanors on their record, this can be a barrier to future employment. So um, we have been lucky enough to partner with some organizations that give us legal support so that people can apply to expunge their, uh, their records, um, and in some cases to hear if you want, uh, if you want to be pardoned, if you have a felony, you must apply for a pardon uh, from the governor. So there are some people who have started that process as well. Um, and also we just engage in communication with uh, people's probation officers if necessary, um, in order to help, you know, let folks know what people are doing when they're participating in our programs. Sometimes that has led to a, a shortening of people's probationary uh, periods, um, which is also extremely helpful in barrier removal in the future for uh, sustainable future employment. Because you can imagine if you need to report to your PO's office uh, weekly or twice a month or with some regular frequency during business hours, um, employers 
can have some challenges with that. It can be difficult to um, maintain employment if that's something that you're contending with with long probationary periods. So those are just a couple of the things that we do for folks. Um, we have a really comprehensive kind of case management and social support network. Um, things like assistance with applying for benefits um, that can help people to be able to show up and be present like SNAP benefits or what some people call food stamps. Um, we help people to connect with medical assistance, with subsidies uh, for utilities like LIHEAP. Um, as we all know, it's very expensive in the winter and we're trying to keep as much money in people's pockets as possible um, so that they can participate in this program. Um, we help people to apply for subsidies for childcare um, because if there's nowhere for their child to be during the day, they cannot successfully attend this program. Um, so again, this is a short, a short amount of the things that we're trying to do on our supportive services team in order to uh, really remove some of these barriers and allow people the opportunity to take part in this program. Thank you for that. I mean, it, you know, it, it needs a real network. And I don't think we were able to really, you know, in the program that we didn't really have that full kind of network of, of, of services. So I think it's really helpful to, to, to hear that. Um, I guess the last question I had for Philadelphia is, um, were you, so the work that you did, the, the work that you do with PowerCore, is that consider, is that sort of maintenance and maintenance focused or is there also a plugin or a piece of this that can partner with active capital projects that the city might be contracting for? Or, it, you know, I'm just wondering how, how that um, could work or if you do that with the capital projects that are ongoing. I care. Oh, Mark, do you want to take this one? No, go ahead, Gerald. You're, 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 you're our rep. Yep. So uh, at, at this point, you know, it is restricted to uh, the work that's being done in operations. Um, so again, that's, that's mostly, you know, maintenance. Um, there, as I, I did mention earlier, though, there are some uh, alumni who are who work with inspection crews. So, you know, they're much more I won't say much more, but they do a little more technical work than some of the other crews are doing in regards to maintenance and pressure. They operate instrumentation. So um, although it is all on the operation side, it is varied in scope um, from inspection to, to maintenance to even aspects of data collection. Thank you. And I'll just add it, but I think it's really important to think about what the bigger picture is. I mean, I, I, I think all the time about getting you know, power core members involved in, in light design and light construction uh, as an expansion on what we're doing. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to run, but I, I did, there's been like one thought that's been stewing in my head the whole time here. And, and, you know, and I think it was Councillor Baker that said it before, this is, this is about workforce development and kind of um, giving opportunities to our residents as much as it is about trying to fill needs as a water department, right? Trying to get our job done at the water department. So, you, you have to look at it from both those, those, those avenues. You have to be aligned. You have to find those opportunities. I mean, the water department just has, we has need, needs and wants and opportunities with our investments. And what PowerCore has allowed us is, to, is to, to satisfy those needs with an amazing program, right? That is well-managed, well-run, you know, the recruitment process, right? It, it, they, they kind of integrate, you know, together for sure. But I, I can't help but think about, you know, cities are moving towards distributed, decentralized, nature-based infrastructure, right? That is what we will be investing in to the tune of billions, if not trillion dollars, you know, in, in, in the next few decades. And really what we're doing is we're investing in neighborhoods and leveraging kind of what's under the neighborhood, right? At least from a water department perspective. And, and what better way than when you invest in your neighborhood by employing the people who live in those neighborhoods. And, and I, can't, I can't stress enough the the ambassador and the 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 you know just the connection you have with the communities you're trying to serve by hiring and working with the folks in those communities and that to me is the special part here is that um, it, this is about opportunity and and we have to think what is it we're trying to do I know we have to think about it from a bottom line costing standpoint I know you know there's all these logistics but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are trying to give opportunities to to, to folks that have not been given you know fair opportunity prior. Um, and, and, and we, as a, as a department has to have to spend billions of dollars, you know, fixing stuff in our, in our communities. And, and I want our residents to, to be part of it. And, and what you're seeing is a, is a little element of it. And the program has been special, 
you know, it's funny, Gerald hopped on about 10 minutes before this call, totally didn't know he was supposed to be on this call. And I think, you know, the energy you see from him is an example of the impact and the importance and the inspiration, I think, uh, of what Power Corps has meant to the water department. So I'll, I'll just leave with that. Um, this is something that should be, uh, you know, uh, replicated in every city. I'll agree with John's point earlier. Um, why reinvent the wheel? Pick what works and, and make it work even better. And, and I really encourage many conversations like this, you know, in the future. And, and as a water department representative, happy to talk about kind of the, big, the bigger program. And I think Julia, as she mentioned before, very happy to, to kind of tell you about all the logistics and, and how to make it work from the power core side. So I'm gonna run, but thank you so much for the opportunity to not just represent the city, but to be part of this conversation. Um, it, it will work in Boston. I guarantee you a program like Power Core will work in Boston um, because it has to, right? And, and, and there's opportunity aplenty. So um, I'm gonna run, thank you so much, take care. And uh, please always reach out to, to Water Department. Uh, we'll figure out a way to, to, to assist in any way. All right, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for, uh, for those uh, inspiring words and great, great way to conclude your remarks, appreciate it. Um, next, we've got David Meshalam, um, and I believe, and then I think uh, Kent Jackson may have a follow-up question. If anyone else would like a further question, or someone uh, perhaps whom I haven't called on yet, please raise your hand uh, uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but David, uh, pl please please proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you, Matt, for uh, not only pronouncing my name correctly, but not confusing me with my brother. Um, <laughs> who you know well. Thank you. It's good to see so many friendly faces and to learn about the great work in, in Philadelphia. Um, and thank you for your leadership on this, Kenzie. Um, my name is David Meshulam. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I decided um, raisingly to, like you, Julia, found a, a new organization. It's called Speak for the Trees Boston, and we focus on community trees uh, and our urban forest here in Boston. Um, and one of our first programs that we've run successfully for two summers now has been our Teen Urban Tree Corps. Uh, and I just wanted to also highlight that our partners over at American Forest uh, created their own tree corps this summer that's uh, being funded by Tazo T and SZA, the, the hip hop musician. Um, and although we don't have SZA here in Boston, uh, there's real excitement, I think, nationally for this type of work. Uh, so maybe we could get a Duncan Marky Mark version of uh, <laughs> the tree core here in Boston. Um, so this year we're really leaning into this idea of workforce development and tree equity in Boston and our program. And, and I'd be, um, I, I'd look forward to sharing that with you as we're developing it um, and thinking about how it, it sort of interlaces with all these overlapping ideas. I just had a quick question um, and I had to step out from um, 10 to 11, so you may have mentioned this, but for the folks from Philadelphia, I'm curious to hear what your relationship is like with other nonprofits. And specifically, I'm talking about Tree Philly. Um, and if you spoke about this earlier, I'll just look at the recording. Uh, no, we're not. Um, we 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 work with uh, as many local nonprofits and as we can. So we actually do quite a bit of the plantings for the Tree Philly Initiative in Philly. Over over a thousand uh, tree plantings a year, for, specifically for that initiative. We joint fundraise with them to make those things happen. That's one example of, of working with those. But and then we have, I think uh, you might have missed this. We have a urban forestry track specifically to start that was built out with them to meet some of the needs that we were seeing around the maintenance once you plant them. Uh, every time we plant a tree, we commit to two years of watering and maintenance to it. So, you know, that just adds to our workload with the parks and with Tree Philly. Um, but it's it's all baked in there. And, and really, it's just finding, you know, the land is is the city land, but lots of nonprofits operate on that. And so we're just coordinating services and filling in gaps that make sense for us to fill in. Great, thank you. And and like you, we're undergoing an urban forest plan um, in the coming year or two. And, and I think this is an exciting opportunity for these things to sort of talk across departments, uh, talk across uh, nonprofit and, and industry. Um, and it does have to be a holistic approach. So um, looking to your great work, um, again, I can't, I can't uh, repeat enough the idea that we should not be reinventing the wheel, that there's great work, not only in Philly, but we see it in places like Atlanta, San Francisco, sort of all over the country, there's energy around this. So thank you for joining us. 
Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, before I want to take folks who haven't spoken yet. So before we get to Kent, I will uh, ask my favorite constituent uh, who blushes every time I say that, Sarah Freeman. Uh, thank you for joining us, Sarah, uh, who's been a great parks advocate for many, many years uh, and uh, resident of Jamaica Plain. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, making me blush again. <laughs> I'm flustered before I speak. Um, I just want to thank the city council for uh, thinking about doing this. Young people are our future and creating meaningful jobs for hard to employ adults um, is huge. So um, you all know I'm a, a green in and out person. It's so easy to take nature for granted. And even with all the evidence this year with people flocking to the parks, um, that doesn't translate to jobs uh, waiting at, at the other end automatically. I heard something on the news the other day that what are graduating high school students looking to for the future in a pandemic. And the top choices were still overwhelmingly tech, uh, business, you know, they all want to work for Google or Amazon. And um, it's how do, how do we make this uh, something they see as important and, and not everyone wants a desk job. And so I know Norfolk, I think this came up at the previous hearing, there's an agricultural school um, at Norfolk, but Boston maybe needs to do some catching up in that um, training. Um, on the Arbor Way, similar, I'll just echo most of what Parker said. We're also, uh, oh, I forgot to say I'm with the Arbor Way Coalition in JP. We're a part of the Emerald Necklace, but under the state jurisdiction. And our one experience kind of related to this is we used to partner with um, UMass Extension had a program they called the Boston Urban Stewards. And we would hire young people to water newly planted trees to improve their chance of survival. But this was not an easy job. Like we had wagons and buckets and uh, in the heat of the summer dragging, dragging water to each tree and having to cross high speed roads. So I'm curious, I don't know if Philadelphia has, or maybe the answer is hire a watering truck and then let the young people do something else. But just curious if there's a chance for getting more either irrigation or uh, I don't know what the answer is, but th that was really heavy lifting. And at the time we were told that they, the young people felt like picking up trash was uh, that they, that was almost an insult. So I loved hearing the part about data collection and measuring how much you collect and seeing it as, as a positive contribution, not the bottom rung of the ladder. Um, let me see, I had one other thing I thought I wanted to say. Um, oh, I know the state it has care, custody and control, but the city is still the landowner. And so I don't know in terms of uh, logistics, what the city role is, but thank you again for thinking about this and uh, look forward to seeing it come to fruition. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Can I speak on the, the, the trash thing? Sure. So when it comes to like those, I guess like people might consider like bottom tier things, especially like members coming in, one of the most important things that I've taken away is that um, as a member is that they address the why. Like when we're picking up trash, they explain like, this trash, these cigarette butts, they get into our water system and they ruin our water systems. And this like plays in the, your drinking water that you use every day, um, which, you know, takes that to another level. It's not, it, it becomes more than just, we're picking up trash just to pick up trash or we're watering trees just to water trees. They explain why these trees need so much water, why uh, newer trees need a certain amount of water. So. Just wanted to throw that in there. Just want to piggyback on that. Yeah. That is really follow up. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Gerald Bright from Water. Um, I wanted to follow up on Allie's point. Um, so we we again we always coined it as aesthetic maintenance. Um, 
you know, as, a, as just a form of, of critical maintenance at our green infrastructure facilities. Um, so it wasn't just picking up trash, but even in doing that, we also uh, made it very clear, as Ali's saying that, you know, the effect on the, the system. So, you know, we'd say if this trash is upstream of an inlet, you're preventing it from getting into the system. So, um, you know, concepts such as drainage area, you know, were introduced. Um, so, you know, you could see um, really the impacts of, of some of these activities um, near site, not just in the site itself. Um, and speaking to your point about water and water access, so one of the things that we do for our contractors um, and for PowerCore, um, we uh, initiate hydrant use permits. So, and along with that permit, there are mandatory training. So, and that's another thing that's great because the PowerCore crews, they get training on the op safe operation of, of our hydrants. Um, and, you know, I guess, and this is something too that's, that speaks to the nature of the partnership and the collaboration with water and, and power core, but you know, over time, you know, I remember there were days where power core they were doing maintenance out of a, a, a cargo van, you know, and that's that's what was available, right? So then it moved into like, okay, now let's get you guys some trucks, now let's get you guys a trailer. So in the beginning, you know, that's some of the things you have to think through. I mean, sometimes you know, those are the resources available. You know, I think power core, I'm not sure, Julia, it may have been a, a van that was left over from you know, some other department's old van you guys took advantage of, but. You know, with that planning, it, it transitioned into, all right, let's get you guys a, a pickup truck with all, all, all wheel drive and, you know, uh, the ability to uh, purchase trailers. Right. So um, and, and tanks for watering. So that that's all part of it, working through the logistics. Um, and it is something that you can phase in. Right. But it should be considered for sure. Is it that's helpful. I just, just a minute, Pat, but I'll get you in one second. Um, I just want to be mindful of the time. It's been about two and a half hours and um, I, everyone has been so generous with your time. So I do want us to begin wrapping this up. But Pat, if you had a brief comment on that. Um, yeah, please. no, I, ju I just want to reiterate because I think this is so critical. Number one is the, the problem I've had with the Lucia's program, no criticism meant, but, and I don't know how it works this year, but in years past the red shirts, it can't be just about picking up trash. There have to be other things that they're engaged in. And even if it's picking up trash, if there is if there is time spent processing, why are we doing this? What is it, how, you know, everything everyone just said about how it's benefiting the community, what problems does it cost? Where, do the, where does this trash on the storm drain end up in the river and all of that? Kids, youth really get serious about it. And we've had youth at the end of the summer, they're, making their parents recycle, they're yelling at their friends for dropping stuff on the ground. So it's not just a job, it becomes something they're committed to and passionate about. So the, that educational piece has to be there. I just, I feel like I can't stress that enough, no matter what you're doing. No, so, I appreciate, yeah. appreciate those comments, thank you. Um, Kent, we're gonna go to you again, and then I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, again, I wanna be mindful of everyone's extraordinary generosity with their time. So if we can wrap it up after Kent, um, that would be great. But yeah. I just wanna echo what Pat said, you know, Sarah and Ali had said, it is the education that can't, my opinion, it can't be book education. It has to be experiential. We focus on watersheds and trees with our teens. It's important to get them out there talking, doing it, and then having them do a presentation that gets to the specific pieces of it. So as Pat said, they then in turn are transformed. That dovetails into my next piece. This has to be about the individual and transforming them. I'm not saying they're bad where they're coming from, but transforming them into an individual who is work ready, not just the hard skills, it's the soft skills, resume writing, interviewing, if you're going to be late, you have to call. You can't, my opinion, you can't expect the first crop, quote unquote, to come out and say, we want to fill 30 jobs and that you have, you have, you can fill those 30 jobs. It may not be realistic. It's going to take time. It's going to take, take, take patience, commitment to the individual. That is extremely important that they are taken care of by the village, quote unquote, by the nonprofit organization, by the municipality, whatever it is, that person is your utmost priority in that I want to read it. It'll take time. I've done this in the past with different organizations, more of the workforce development, not so much 
and I mental education and exposure and interconnection, more workforce development. And it takes time. You'll get your individuals who may be the best worker, but he doesn't call when he's going to be late. So you get to work on that. Or someone who, you know, not the best worker, but calls when they're late. You have so many intricacies. And I know I'm preaching to some of the choir here, but just in terms of creating it for Boston, that has to be kept in mind. And those individuals have to be your utmost, um, of utmost importance. And I'll shut up now. Thank you. Agreed, Ken. Thank you. Uh, well said. Um, not hearing or seeing any other hands. Uh, Sarah, your hand is up, but I assume that's from earlier. Perfect. Yep. Nope. No worries. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, before we get to Kenzie for the concluding remarks on behalf of Councilor Buck and Councilor Wu, um, Chief Cook or uh, Chief Sullivan, did you have any sort of concluding thoughts before we recess this working session? I don't, Councilor. Thank you very much for having us. Chief? Okay, I don't. You. Yeah, and I don't either, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you and look forward to additional working sessions. Absolutely, and, and thank you to uh, Commissioner Woods as well. Um, uh, Councillor Bach, uh, I know you, you wanted to, uh, ha you had a statement prepared as well, but I wanted to let you do concluding remarks and then I will recess this working hearing, which is a slight technicality from just adjourning it because uh, as I imagine you and Councillor, we would like a continued working session as we can uh, do the work uh, going forward. So um, thank you, Councillor Bach, uh, for your leadership. Obviously count me as a fervent supporter uh, and and just and so impressed with what is happening in, in Philly and look to continue to replicate and build on the successes there and continue partnership. And I mean it, I think that God willing, the, the uh, things will improve in our country and in our world in the months ahead. And I really think it would be a worthwhile endeavor to, to go down and visit and see firsthand some of the great success down there. So I look forward to it. Um, and thank you all for taking the time uh, to uh, work with us and, and share with us some of the great successes. And thank you, of course, to the advocates who have been just the, the backbone of uh, the really impressive uh, environmental movement here in Boston. So uh, Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Councillor O'Malley. And yes, I just really want to echo the thanks to everybody. We really appreciate the time from the folks in Philly. We appreciate our own departments, um, Chief Cook and uh, and Commissioner Woods and uh, and John Sullivan and uh, um, Trin for for being with us and for listening to so much um, of the Philadelphia content. Because um, as as has been addressed, you know, leadership within the city and kind of that sort of interagency leadership that helps us work out those kinks and really like bring something to fruition. I mean, that's that's what we're gunning for here. Um, and so as a counselor, I'm really grateful to all the departments um, for their involvement. And, and I wanna um, echo and underscore something that, uh, you know, Mark um, Camarada said before he had to hop off, which is just, I think we really see this in Boston as being something that we would wanna have um, be aimed squarely at not just the maintenance, but also the capital project side of things, because I think we have so much capital work to do. I, I've talked a lot about how there's an opportunity to expand our environmental work within our capital budget. Um, with some of these things that from urban forestry to green infrastructure, like there's really an opportunity to sort of um, scale up in a continuous way. They're not just one big project um, like we face when we talk about like building a school or some of the other things in our capital projects. And, and, I, and I think that that piece is really important also when we talk about closing the racial wealth gap with a program like this. Um, so I know one of the things that uh, Dave Queeley who had to jump off before he could comment but wanted to underscore was, you know, and, and Councillor Braden um, had some conversation with Julie about this, but the hope that these power core folks who you're training not only end up as city employees and well compensated union employees and utility employees, et cetera, but also that ultimately they're in a position to be contractors who own their own contracting businesses and can get some of the real green infrastructure um, like work, right? The the sort of substantive capital work that we're creating. And I just think um, the goal here should be for the city to think about whether it's through John's, you know, stormwater fee and the kind of regulatory apparatus we're setting up there that's going to incentivize a bunch of private actors to want to put in green infrastructure systems to the carbon performance standards that we're talking about on the building side here in the city um, to all, like to to sort of the urban forestry plan, which once you have an urban forestry plan, you know, begets the question of how are we going to execute it on Commissioner Woods' side. Um, you know, the idea here is really to meet those needs that the city is articulating and sort of bringing into being 
with a workforce that is ours, that is Bostonian, that you know is is led by our Black and Brown folks, that gives opportunity to people who haven't had opportunity. Um, and and I just I think we can't stress enough, um, and I really want to stress on behalf of myself and Councillor Wu that um, that that's the goal here, not for these things to be completely intertwined, and not for it to just be like you know a a good environmental program that maybe could like help with the racial wealth gap and and racial inequity in the city on the side or just an economic program that maybe will do like a few kind of green things on the edge, right? The goal is to say we have two major um, crises that require urgency that the city is facing and there's an opportunity to, to have an intertwined answer to them. So um, we are definitely gonna keep working on this in earnest and we're really grateful for all of your partnership. Um, certainly would love to visit Philadelphia. Um, so I uh, have some, uh, some elderly relatives who are recently vaccinated there. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, just again, thanks so much to everyone for your time and Mr. Chairman for uh, chairing a great working session. Here, here. Thank you for your leadership, uh, Councilor Buck. Uh, the working session of the Committee of Environment, Sustainability and Parks is hereby recessed and looking forward to continuing the work uh, and you will all be hearing from us uh, in short order. So thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. Thank you. Great, great working session.